It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. I have a really fun panel this week. Uh, Lisa Schmeiser is here from IT Pro Today. Lindsay Turrentine, super smart from CNET. And of course, our own Lori Gill from MacBreak Weekly and iMore.com. And do we have a lot to talk about? The tech titans testifying once again in Congress. What does it mean? A fork in the road for PC architectures. And we're going to be streaming not just movies, but games and soon even Windows. Plus, a PC that boots up from a vinyl disc. It's all coming up next on Twit. This Week in Tech comes to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees LastPass? Can ensure they are. By making access and authentication seamless, whether employees are working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 798. Recorded Sunday, November 22nd, 2020. The Lighthouse Keeper and his robot butler. This episode of This Week in Tech is brought to you by Tibco. Tibco's connected intelligence platform simplifies the way you capture data, connect applications, and turn decisions into actions. Learn more about how Tibco can unlock the value of your company's real-time data at tibco.com slash podcast. And by LastPass. Give your IT and security leaders control of password security with the award-winning LastPass. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. And by CashFly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with CashFly's CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. And by IT Pro TV. Get professional IT training with the experts. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription. Use the code TWIT30 at checkout. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we talk about the week's tech news. And this is the Liquid Consonant Edition. I just realized everybody on this show's name begins with L. I'm Leo. That's Lindsay. Lindsay Turretine, Senior Vice President, Content and Audience at CNET. Holy cow. Uh, this is not the different job for you, just a, the title keeps shifting. The title changed a teeny bit. It's basically the same job with the same awesome team. Nice. Now a Red Venture mm -hmm. uh, publication, but that's good, right? That's it's gonna, a good thing. Yeah, it's going to be good for you. It's a good thing. Good. Yeah. So nice to see you. Uh, it's great to be here. Lisa Schmeiser is also here, another liquid consonant, editor at IT Pro Today. Good to see you, Lisa. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yeah. No cookies today? No Girl Scout cookies? <laughs> Not until Q1 2021. Oh, I want my Samoas. <laughs> Have me on anytime after um, Martin Luther King Day, and I can okay. probably connect you. I didn't realize that. For some reason, I thought it was the, it was now. Yeah. But it wouldn't make sense because everybody's making, you know, holiday cookies. you got to save mm -hmm. them for when we're really desperate for sweets. And also from Mac Break Weekly, we've been seeing a lot of her lately. I'm thrilled. Lori Gill, managing editor at iMore.com. How's it going? Hi, Lori. You woke me up on a Sunday to join the show. It's No, so you wouldn't be still <laughs> sleeping at 2.45 in the afternoon. Well, Come you on. know, I, I'm a party girl. <laughs> Maybe in the days when you were singing in the punk clubs, but uh, yeah. I yeah. doubt... In fact, there's a there was a curfew. We have, we're under curfew now. Yeah, I know. Here in it's California, crazy. We got to go to bed by ten. Yeah, nobody's allowed to be out after ten. Can you believe that? Wow. I think it it's is great. a little I, bit it, weird, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's a band aid solution, but if any anything to tr try to remind people that we need to stop yeah. being in each other's presence. You know, anything mm -hmm. that we can do to help. I'm I'm curious about yeah. what the motivation is. Is it just to keep people from having parties? Is that basically I it? think it has to and be bars. nightclubs, bars, restaurants, big groups. And even, but the even in your, in your spread things have been private parties. Um, yeah, it, yeah, I think they're trying to keep people from having parties at their house because that's where the, the spread is happening. See, I question how effective a curfew will be because 
if you've got a gated community where everybody is operating under the premise that what other people don't know doesn't hurt them, you know, you mm-hmm. could have parties going on that nobody cracks down on, for example. Yeah. Well, <laughs> so. the police, are, they've, are, they've, they've also said that the police are not going to really enforce this as much as they're going to yeah. be sort of like requesting and advising. So nobody's going to get mm-hmm. fined for doing it. But, you yeah. know, we're kind of in this weird situation where, um, we're having to to do things to try to mitigate uh, the spread mm-hmm. of COVID-19, but also trying to make people feel like they can continue their daily life. And it's it's a real struggle because you can't go back from telling people that they can now, you know, go go out to restaurants. It's, you, it's really difficult to go back from that because people are, they're tired of it. They're tired mm-hmm. of the situation. They want yeah. to be able to go to the bars and go out to restaurants and they don't like being told that they can't, even though they would have in March or April now that mm-hmm. they were allowed to and now having that taken back from them, that's just, it's it's just, it's kind of just part of our emotional state. People just don't mm-hmm. want to do it anymore. It, it, the same exact thing happened during the Spanish flu. They, you know, it's, they had mask mandates and then they took away the mask mandates and then they put the mandates back in and everybody went wild because they didn't want to have to wear masks anymore. We're just going through the same thing again. Isn't that yeah. funny? A hundred years later, we're going through exactly, it's, mm-hmm. the playbook hasn't changed. Well, there's one thing that's different. In 1918, they didn't have TikTok houses. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have to worry about a bunch of 20-somethings getting together having massive parties I, I honestly think this curfew is the TikTok curfew to be honest yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you sure yeah. they didn't have like ether parlors where people got together and, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm going down to the ether parlor man yeah. don't bug me I gotta yeah you know. no, nobody is angrier about parties I have found actually than teenagers because yeah. they so desperately want to go back to high school Yes. Yeah. They, when they hear about twenty somethings having parties, they get pissed because they're like, "You're ruining it for me." Knock it off. Yeah. Well, that's because you have good teenagers. I don't mm-hmm. think I don't think all teenagers feel that way. <laughs> um, You're ruining it for all of us. Uh, yeah. I think there are plenty of teenagers who who just go, "Please, I just can't, I have to live my life." We have a senior. Uh, Michael's Me eight, too. He, so his 18th his, poor kid this is the worst year ever his 18th <sighs> birthday is Thursday it's on Thanksgiving oh, and we were going to have all and he a lot of family in town we were going to have everybody over for a big Thanksgiving dinner slash 18th birthday party and we had to say and you know what he said last night which is great he says that's okay we'll have it on my 19th which oh, is, oh what a oh, sweet guy I know yeah. that is great we have a senior we have a we have a senior also and it is just mm-hmm. such a bummer they're not gonna uh, maybe they'll get to walk there's a thin mm-hmm. chance that maybe the the vaccine will will come out and enough people will get it that by May God that would be nice if they could just I don't know walk. I think that honestly I mean mm-hmm. in, in my house they don't care about walking they care about missing the year. Like this yeah. is the year they're all going to be big Ben on campus and yeah. pull their senior pranks and they feel, you know, I, or, it's, or, just, yeah, it's you, just sad. When you got, you know, you can't mm-hmm. tape anybody to the flagpole when you're not uh, when you're <laughs> by a Zoom. <laughs> exactly. It just, it, just, it just doesn't work. These pranks were planned out. <laughs> I didn't, the TikTok house apparently is such a big deal that there is a company in LA that does TikTok house rental that was just uh, acquired. Was just like acquired. I'm trying to find the story because I can't. I I didn't bookmark it because I didn't think it was consequential. But it kind of <laughs> blew my mind. They were just acquired by another big company because uh, there's so much money in TikTok house rentals. Mm-hmm. Crazy. That's crazy. I know. This world is so weird. We live in a very, in very, very. We live in the weirdest times. timeline. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I really wonder what's going to happen on Thanksgiving. Uh, there, there is some evidence that uh, already the TSA is reporting last yesterday a million people went through the checkpoints. It's the first time a million people have been at the airport since May. Oh. Um, that the people are traveling. And this is not even quite Thanksgiving yet. Uh, people are traveling. In fact, I think I saw a stat that said 38% of people plan to have a Thanksgiving with, to travel to a Thanksgiving with 10 or more people. Uh, which is exactly what the CDC is saying. Do not do. So I don't know what I don't know what Christmas is going to be like, but I'm afraid. A lot of small funerals. That's what they say. Isn't yeah. That, oof. Yeah. That's oh, a nightmare. That's sad. All right, let's get off that subject. Let's get yeah. back to TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> TikTok was <laughs> complaining oh, last it's week. Ridiculous. They were saying, "What happened? You were going to shut us down, and we haven't heard from you." 
<laughs> that was a mistake. So it's like when I'm at the when I'm working with a trainer, I say, "Boy, that was easy." Never ever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't no, 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 poke no. the lion. <laughs> yeah. So immediately the commerce department says, "Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, forgot about you." Um, yeah. So I, so the Equis, I don't know what's going on. It Walmart and Oracle were going to buy them. <laughs> I was even just saying that just mm -hmm. makes me laugh. Uh, TikTok was saying, is that going to happen? I don't even know. I feel like they were doing that for a, to do a favor. Yeah. To, I, mm, there seemed I don't know. To be some I would be, I will place for money chat. on it not happening. You think nothing's going to happen. Yeah. It felt like it was at the time, a political thing. Uh, and uh, the president has moved on. So the National yes. Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien, just gave a speech in Vietnam where he was saying, look, these court cases are ongoing. The federal government is going to wait for direction from the courts to tell us what we can and can't right. do. Right, because Judge Beetlestone uh, suspended mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. initial shutdown, which is supposed to happen Friday. Yeah. Um, so I don't but know. But it honestly seems like this was more of a saber rattling, ham handed attempt to remind China that they can affect its commerce with the U.S. than it is a serious matter of policy or or any sort of tech acquisition. I mean, you're looking at a lame duck administration that says, "Oh, we're going to do this once the courts let us." But, but feasibly <laughs> speaking, is this going to happen before you, January twentieth? You, you almost they almost feel like they're thinking. <laughs> And with any luck, we won't have to worry about it in a couple of months. Like, yeah. Because they, they painted exactly. themselves into a weird corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it, one of the, the lawsuit that Judge Beetlestone ruled on was from three TikTok influencers <laughs> who make their living on TikTok who said, mm -hmm. Your Honor, if the Commerce Department cuts off TikTok servers, which was supposed to happen on Friday, that's going to cost us millions of dollars in, in revenue. And the judge said, yes, it's unfair mm -hmm. To TikTok influencers. Mm -hmm. I just like saying Judge Beetlestone. That's a, that's mm -hmm. really the only reason I put that <laughs> I thought you were going to say you just like saying TikTok influencers because that's a funny one too. Yeah, that oh, yeah. one too. <laughs> what? We live in an interesting uh, times, interesting uh, world. <laughs> that's that's all there is. Did yeah. you, did any of you watch, I couldn't, I didn't even bother mm -hmm. uh, Zuckerberg and, and, and Dorsey testifying once again in front of Congress this week. <laughs> Why are you laughing? I'm laughing. So I'm married to another tech reporter um, at Tom's Guide, and he put up a screen grab of Jack Dorsey and Zuckerberg next to each other side by side. And he tweeted, this looks like a show about um, a stranded lighthouse keeper and the robot butler he built to keep him company. <laughs> Let me guess which is which. The one with the beard is the lighthouse keeper, yes. right? Yes. Yes. Well, it, it went massively viral. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I gotta now I gotta find this. Uh, so I'm, this I'm tweet. gonna look for I'm gonna look for the tweet now and see if I can drop it into our Slack discussion because this thing went massively viral, and I had people I haven't talked to Here in years. Is. All my timeline, all yeah. Here you it got is. It. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Lighthouse <laughs> keeper and robot butler, Zuckerberg. <laughs> and that, is is it Mike? Was it Mike's tweet? No, no, somebody no, else took it. It's, yeah, no, I will. Um, oh, someone else. It stole really that does look like <gasps> he looks like data. He oh really my does. Gosh. No, yeah. I'm dropping in the. I'm I'm dropping in the oh, original okay. um, link for you for Skype now. Oh, so I that can't do it from Skype. I don't have access oh. to that. Uh, oh my gosh! What's which ones? Look at all of these. Which ones? Mm. Even Kenji Lopez got in there. Which oh, one is uh, your husband of all of these? Look, Michael's. Which, <laughs> oh, he got no, the first Michael one. Michael Vase. Um, no. Oh, no, no, no. Jack Dorsey looked at their offering membership. Yeah, Philip Michaels is the first one. Yeah. Um, the Senate hearing looks like the tale of a maroon lighthouse keeper and the robot butler he built to stave <laughs> off loneliness. Yeah. Oh, my God. It really does. <laughs> yeah. I think um, there's a movie there. <laughs> <laughs> but um, That's creepy as hell. I think the question I have about all of these hearings is how useful are they if you are talking to a bunch of legislators who still aren't quite up to date on the scope and the breadth of what these social networks do? So these were blatantly yeah. political the last yes. time. Is, was it again this time pretty much? I mean, and why even bother? The election's over. What do they hope to gain at this point? Well, this is still an issue. Yeah. I mean, 
it's it's imp- I'm glad that we're talking about it. The timing yeah. is probably not very useful because it's because of the lame duck it's session. A lame duck, but, yeah. but it's an important conversation. And, and I, I actually I think that legislatures are starting to learn more about it. We've seen some really smart questions and takedowns and some mm-hmm. really stupid ones, too. But mm-hmm. it kind of depends on the legislator. And if they've learned anything in this election cycle, it's that the Internet matters. Yeah. Uh, the other point somebody made is where's Susan Wojcicki on this? Doesn't isn't YouTube oh. at least as culpable as Facebook and Twitter at spreading election disinformation? Well, it's hard to measure culpability, but it's yeah. so important. I mean, the, mm-hmm. this the the algorithmic rabbit holes that people go down and never come mm-hmm. out of are so damaging. Mm-hmm. So I was at an event, I may have been RSA, or it was another one, where um, a senior leadership team from YouTube was speaking, and they were supposed to be addressing the topic of, here's how diversity helped us deal with concerns that were coming up with our YouTube for Kids product. And I thought, oh, this ought to be good, since um, how YouTube aims its uh offerings at children and and again pulls those kids into rabbit holes where yes. they're just clicking and what was interesting is when the YouTube executives began speaking they said well we were identifying a real problem with our YouTube kids product and I thought oh this is great we're going to start talking about oh there were videos that were inserting upsetting content or they weren't factual or they were marketing pitches and they're like and they said the problem is the kids weren't spending enough time on the oh! app and it wasn't sticky enough. Oh, so whoa. we started looking at how they were using it so we could boost engagement. And wow. we're thought, just not we're just not thought, addictive enough. That's the problem. I need to know about YouTube's priorities. They're wow. never and the argument I'm sure they'll make is we're not a publisher. We don't have to be responsible for the content on our right. platform. But yet I think you do have an executive team at YouTube where engagement is is their top concern over anything else. Well, I and, think you can say the same thing on Facebook. I don't know about Twitter. Oh, yeah. Twitter's priorities are more free speech than engagement, I think. <laughs> but, but, but literally, YouTube and Facebook's entire algorithmic system is designed to make increase engagement and stickiness, to get you to spend more time there, right? We were just in the house talking about this this morning, that one of the interesting side effects of that is that, so we know that fear and anger create engaging yes. content and people do yeah. engage, which is why so many young men get radicalized on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's upsetting, but one of the things that it leaves is really bad marketing. So as we kind of go through time, I think when you start to think about Facebook, as a product, your emotional reaction to that product is generally negative now because when you log in, you see negative stuff. And I think over time, it's going to kill these brands. Maybe not YouTube, but Facebook. It's really bad for them. Yeah. Well, it, if people leave because it's unpleasant. Yeah. And I don't think anybody at either Facebook or Twitter or uh, YouTube is saying, oh, yes, look for the most, the stuff that makes you angriest or look for the stuff that makes you more upset they're simply saying it's easy it's a simple mm-hmm. thing what content generates the most engagement mm-hmm. what do, what do people stay watching the longest what gets them to click more what keeps them on the site longer mm-hmm. that's all you have to do and it and and it's the nature of humanity lindsay that mm-hmm. that means you're going to get the angry crazy <laughs> all this stuff yeah and this yeah. is what happened to local news, right? <laughs> you know, it, it was uh, local television news. It, you know, film at 11, it was all about engagement and it ended up going the yeah. lowest common denominator. It's what happened There's to TV. There's a Don Henley song, Dirty Laundry. From Dirty the Laundry. That, that, uh, that. Now, I uh, was recently rereading Neil Stephenson's book, Fall or Dodge in Hell. I love that book. But there's the entire section in the middle where one of the characters, Sophia, as a college student, is going through part of the country she's not used to being in and negotiating yes. with subculture she's not used to. Yes. And what I thought was really interesting in that book was uh, Stevenson um, uses Facebooked as an adjective mm-hmm. to describe a type of online or, or even face-to-face discourse that is all about getting that engagement rush as opposed to a substantive ex- exchange of ideas. And um, one of the geniuses of good sci-fi writers is they're really good at kind of anticipating where you're going to be 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And the fact that he was already pegging social media as this, as this, what is the opposite of a value add? Whatever the opposite of a value add. A value subtract. (laughs) Yeah, a value (laughs) subtract, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, he was talking about like that. And I couldn't help but think about that with, you know, a lot of uh, 
what we're looking at now in terms of how what role did social media play? Um, Fall yeah. also has I love like I love the book. It's a little hard, it's not maybe not a great novel, but mm -hmm. the as usual with Neil, the the, the, mm -hmm. the ideas are really provocative. One of the other things people in fall do is they wear uh, a mask, which is initially intended to defeat face recognition because it's so ubiquitous. But ultimately what ends up happening is you can project, you have, you own different persona, all signed with the crypto key and all that. And you can project the persona, the person you want to be at the moment you're being it, whether it's hanging out with your friends or at a store, that you completely control the person person that is in public mm -hmm. and i thought that was a really interesting I idea that's gonna happen it is happening you don't even, in a minor it, way yeah. l'oreal just released an app this yes, did you like see that l'oreal yes. the makeup company mm -hmm. now you can actually pay a small amount to look to have an ai face done for your call. I almost mm -hmm. did it for today just to try it but then i didn't get around mm -hmm. to it it's, but basically have l'oreal do my makeup via Mm -hmm. machine it's l'oreal which is a makeup company but it's mm -hmm. virtual makeup it's stuff yeah. that you would use in your zoom call or your yeah. twit mm -hmm. appearance <laughs> to but this is like snapchat filters what's the only the thing that's interesting about it's coming from a traditional brick and mortar yeah. makeup company right yeah and you can use it for class you know you can imagine mm -hmm. high school kids using this in class yeah. and you just don't have to put anything on you just turn on your machine it works pretty well i tried it yeah. on my phone does it yeah. Well, and of course, uh, increasingly we're getting phones with LiDAR built in. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. Thanks mm -hmm. to Apple uh, that will be even better at is superimposing stuff on your on your mm -hmm. face. Yeah. It's just for women, though. What about us guys? Is, uh, is there a L'Oreal man? You can men? use it, too. Yeah. I'm not Th that means there are on... women in the picture, but there's no reason you can't have yellow eyelashes, Leah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's a fascinating point, though. The marketing versus who might want to use it. Yeah. Plenty of guys. So. Yeah. It, what's also interesting is they've made it, it, of course, it's a Snapchat filter, but they've made it not only for Snapchat, but it's Google Duo, uh, yeah. for Instagram, for Snap Camera, which is Snapchat's, uh, you know, Zoom uh, plug-in. Uh, mm -hmm. You can get volumizing capsules. You can get plump shot. What is that plump? Your, what, your, what? I, I think it's basically, it just, it fills out, it's like getting Botox or fillers. It, it fills out your lips with... Yeah. And it works like it really looks like you have fillers? It it the the makeup like kind of fleshes out your lips. You know, uh, movie stars have had this for years. Uh, <laughs> it's democratizing. It's just democratizing it. <laughs> the it's all it's this was the dirty little secret of motion picture making for at least the last 10 years was it's often in the contract the movie stars contract you will mm -hmm make these modifications to the movie star before you publish the film. And mm -hmm. they have, there's plenty of tools that will do this frame by frame, but now, and everybody could do it. And, and more importantly, you could do it in real time. So you don't have to, you know, I, it does, it, it smooths. It's the, when I was trying it, my description of it is that it smooths out your face so aggressively that it's almost <laughs> upsetting. <laughs> It's the, like well, remember Google stopped using the term beauty filter because they thought that that was pigeonholing. This is beauty is uh, you know a lineless face. Mm -hmm. So they now just I don't know they have another word for it that isn't uh, judgmental. Smoothing. Yeah, something like that. But <laughs> wow. uh, but that is kind of I mean that's it's not in a, no way ageist. <laughs> yeah, you thinning. <laughs> Just in time for fleets, which mm. is not an enema. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it is an enema, but it's also Twitter's disappearing tweets, which look exactly like Snapchat's disappearing tweets, which look exactly like Instagram's disappearing movies. It's pretty much a, they didn't even bother to make it look different. It's still, a, it's a circle at the top of the Twitter thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but what do you think of the name? Is that a good name? Lisa, you, <laughs> I hear a big sigh coming from Lisa Schmeiser. <laughs> I 
I, I can see the logic where I can just imagine the move, the, the meeting where someone said fleet because it rhymes with tweet. So we're maintaining our brand identity here. And, and it's fleeting. <laughs> and it's fleeting. Yeah. No, somebody really loves this name. It's I have a feeling terrible. someone in that organization is super excited about it. And I just, I, I'm i sighing because I could imagine it so easily. And I hate that I could. <laughs> I also hate the tweet that announced it. The yeah. thing you didn't tweet but wanted to, but didn't, but got so close. But then you were like, nah, we have a place for that now. Fleets rolling out there. Doesn't this go back to the whole lack of, um, doesn't this go back to the whole emotional engagement and um, getting that dopamine hit? And I don't and think we should encourage people emotions. to yeah. tweet something they th decided not to tweet. Yeah. In the first place. That's not what the world needs. Like, why it, don't you have a pause button instead where you're it's like, the other you direction. Tweet? Do you really want to tweet that? Yes. Why don't we have, Think harder let's before do you like tweet the that. Apple breathing, the Apple Watch breathing exercise for a minute. And yeah. then if you're still sure at the end of it, then we will let you tweet it. <laughs> you I have a completely opposite opinion on this one. You like, love uh -huh. you love fleets. I haven't made a single one yet. But uh -huh. my experience, I think, with rolling out new features, social media, is in general, Twitter especially, has tested the daylights out of anything that they roll out. And they're pretty certain it's going to be successful and that That's people really want it. The and then also people like people who are really engaged in Twitter love to complain about changes. But it'll catch <laughs> on. And I promise, like, you mark my words, in a year, if somebody takes away fleets, people will be really, really upset. And I also mm -hmm. think that if you're not into Instagram and you're into Twitter for different reasons, it gives you a chance to do some things that you wouldn't do on Instagram because Instagram isn't a news platform. Mm. So it gives you a chance to use a different format for that kind of commentary. And let's say you don't want something to stay in your timeline forever. There are people, you know, who delete their timelines every week mm -hmm. because they yeah. just don't really? want a record of it. Oh, yeah. yeah. I wish. There are a lot of people who just every week go back and delete all their tweets because they just don't want it on the record. That's mm -hmm. actually, So now there's another way to do it. And I can't take credit for this insight, but some I wish I could remember <laughs> who said it. But really the problem, if you want to f f pinpoint the problem with Twitter, is that it's ephemera. It is something that just hot take off the top of your head that really shouldn't last. So it's, it's, it's water cooler talk that lasts forever. That's written yeah. on like stone. And, and, and honestly, that's where most people get into trouble. It's the thing they said four years ago in mm -hmm. jest that now out of context is horrific. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And or, or just sort of like, you know, your fleeting thoughts, just like you're saying, like it, at some point, in some part, Twitter does, you, you do want to get those likes and those clicks and those engagement reactions. But sometimes you just like, you just want to say something to the world. You just want to yell it into the void. But Twitter is not that void. But you do it anyway. And then later you go, oh, yeah, I forgot I did that. I'm going to take that down now. And even like we've heard of some people who have like their entire careers were destroyed because of some sort of flippant thing that they weren't thinking. They didn't think about before they tweeted it. And, you know, 24 hours later, it's it's still there. It's still horrible. Or maybe they took it down and put an apology there. But it's like, if you if you you know have the option for it to just disappear after 24 hours, maybe people will forget that you said that really stupid thing that you didn't mean to say. You know, like there's or never notice in the first place, <laughs> or maybe never noticed in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for that, there is this. Looks like you need Iceland.com. Are you familiar oh, with this look at site? That. So this no. is an actual field in the middle of nowhere in Iceland with a giant speaker set up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am going to tap to scream. Please scream responsibly. The world is listening. Ah! And now I'm going to... Ah! Now I'm going to send my scream to Skokarvas, South... Uh -huh. Finland. This is the screen name that's going to appear, and I'm calling from Petaluma in the uh -huh. United States of America. Apparently from all over the world, people are screaming. So, I'm a little surprised they don't have the countries ranked by the frequency of who's screaming. And then I can even have them email me with <laughs> a uh, a video of my scream. It this was Out of that, that yellow out box. of this yellow speaker in Iceland. 
Uh, I just yeah, I just screamed in Iceland, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I would love to know like a, a breakdown. Who's screaming the most? <laughs> yeah. Like, is there seems, a time it seems of day like where sheep it's... don't mind? Yeah. And does Bjork have access to all of those screams for a future project? <laughs> I bet you this yeah. is from Bjork. What do you think? Oh, yeah. uh, they moved the speaker around apparently so that no that one fair. one neighborhood should have to suffer. <laughs> Yeah. For too long. This started with COVID, oh, and I think it was Iceland's response uh, to quarantine. To, to let it out. Let it out. Crazy. Yeah. Anyway, that's what Twitter should have done. But instead, it's preserved these screams <laughs> that uh, should have been sent to Iceland never to be heard again are actually <laughs> preserved forever <laughs> on Twitter. So uh, to get back to this congressional testimony, this isn't about Section 230. This wasn't about uh, anything but just, I, I don't understand why they still, even after the election, want a grandstand. Fundraising is oh. a 24-7 thing, man. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Like the, just yeah. because the elections are over doesn't mean they don't want to you know, keep their job. Can mm. get get somewhere bigger next year or, or four years from now or something oh, like guess. that. Yeah. But this yeah. is definitely something that's important for us to be. This discussion does need to be had. I think what I've learned in the past year is that if you think about, you know, maybe a year ago or earlier this year, what these hearings were like, it was really like an eye rolling peacock fest that just made you want to throw things at your television set or your computer. And they've or gotten in Iceland, better. As, as the case, you want to you want to scream <laughs> it, scream to Iceland, yeah. They've gotten better. They're they're starting to realize that they actually have to ask important questions, and it's not just a place to say, you know, will you promise to do X, Y, and Z? Because that's my platform. They don't they don't do that as much. They really are coming to the table now with like, okay, here's what our constituents are actually worried about. Here's what. What are what we've been researching, and there are people who are kind of behind the scenes telling them things like this is what's going on, this is what the issue is, this is what we need to work on, and they're starting to bring that to the table now. And I think that we will see some real discussions being had about this sort of thing in the near future, maybe within the next year. So, I guess the question is, and I, maybe it was Ted Cruz who crystallized this. He asked. Uh, Doris, Jack Dorsey about Twitter's decision to add labels uh, to the president's tweets about mm -hmm. voter fraud. Cruz said, you're a publisher when you're doing that. He barked. You're mm -hmm. entitled to take a policy position, but you don't get to pretend you're not a publisher and therefore get special benefit under Section 230. That doesn't seem unfair. Just for those who are not following this, it's something we've been talking about for months. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act says, in effect, that uh, just because you're publishing on the Internet, a comment section, a chat room, Twitter, Facebook, doesn't mean you're a publisher. And in fact, you're protected in, in, mm -hmm. if you decide to delete content or not delete content. You can't be sued for what a third party posts on your site. Now, clearly, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter are publishers, too, of content that they create but that most of the content on those sites are not created by them, so they're not liable for that. That, many people consider, is the, as a foundational law that made the Internet possible. Mm -hmm. I know I wouldn't be able to have a, an IRC chat room if I could be sued for what people say in there. I wouldn't have comments on a forum <laughs> or on a YouTube post if I, if I were be liable for what they say. So that protects me, and it has been a very important thing for the development of the uh, Internet. But it is true that if you start acting like a publisher, you shouldn't have a safe harbor, right? And Leah, there's also is... something to consider, which is that just like you're saying, you wouldn't you wouldn't have a, a, a forum if, if you weren't protected. But there are lots of people who are harassed and, um, you know, like have all kinds of horrible things said to them, said about them. And, and these non-publishers like Twitter and Facebook and stuff, they just shrug and say... We didn't do it, so we're not going to really make a big deal about it. I think they get Navy really business. nervous about policing it, and this is a problem with 230, and I don't know what the solution is, but they get really nervous about policing it because I think that they are concerned that once they start to police in a detailed way, they are then liable to police everything, which they can't mm -hmm. figure out That's how no, to do. No, 230 specifically says, though, mm -hmm. you can do that. 
And it doesn't you can make delete. you a publisher. You can, so, and even if you act as a publisher in some aspects, that doesn't mean you're suddenly liable for content that third parties put on your site. I have a blog. I'm liable mm. for the blog content, but I'm not liable under Section 230 for the comments on that blog. That And that's one thing Ted Cruz is a little confused about. But and there's very specifically a safe harbor so that you – this is the other thing that these guys, I think, don't understand. If you eliminate 230, that eliminates moderation because – it's 230 that's protecting you when you moderate. Yes? You don't, you, Lindsay, you think that it, it uh, any moderation? I just, I'm, going, I'm trying to go back to my very, very early days on the internet. And I'm talking about like the year 2000 and how much time we spent kind of worrying about the degree to which we, meaning publishers, mm -hmm. uh, got involved at all. Because right. the concern was mm -hmm. if you start to get involved, then you are acting as a publisher. And deleting is one thing. And I think that we have evolved, the internet has evolved and all of the understanding of laws and, and this one in particular has evolved to allow us to do more uh, deleting to protect people. But there is still, but it could be argued, the opposite could be argued, which is that once you start to make decisions and mm -hmm. really detailed decisions about what is fair game, you're then responsible for all decisions and you're acting as a publisher because you are editing. Yeah. And so I think that the social media sites have had to try to navigate this and they do it wrong a lot. Um, but I think that 230 itself probably needs to evolve to give more flexibility to allow that safe harbor without publishers having to worry about going a step too far and then becoming responsible for what people are saying on that platform. It's, it's just a tough, tough question because it's true. I think it's fair to say that um, you know, Twitter is in, in many ways playing a communications role that's more similar to the phone company than a common a carrier newspaper. instead of a publisher. But it is not the yeah. same as a phone yeah. company because no. the, the record is permanent and it's not one to one. So it yeah. is a difficult one. Yeah. Um, to get into more of the internet old school thing, I actually remember um, <laughs> in 1995, people were debating whether or not ISPs were considered publishers right. because they would allow people to put up bonkers websites. Um, I actually in 1995, I did some, I, I did a news story on Stormfront because they had rolled out their website and they had forums and were beginning to recruit. And the question was, the ISP that lets Stormfront run its operation, are they responsible as a publisher? And ultimately they concluded, no, the whole point to a common carrier is it provides a service to anyone who can pay the fee. And there are terms and conditions for the service, but you can't just go in willy-nilly. It has to be something that's provably detrimental to the service. Um well, that's what interesting. What I wonder is if social media is going to get to the point where they're going to argue that they're more like an ISP in that they're equal, they, they offer equal access. And um, as such, it's just whoever can pay to play gets to. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's because it, it seems th these are all companies that are, you know, fundamentally selling data. Um, what they generate on the end, the harassment campaigns or the incorrect tweets or the Facebook groups that are used to organize, like that's the user experience. But from a business model, every single one of these companies is in the business of harvesting data and then selling slice and dice data products to somebody else. So. They're going to do whatever there, they There can. are two things here. There's the law, which is very clear. Mm -hmm. In fact, that one of the things I'm, I'm so hesitant to modify 230 mm -hmm. because it, in, it, is, it is so almost perfect in its very simplistic, clear description. It's almost like a constitutional amendment. It's mm -hmm. very simple. There's also, though, public pressure. If you are publishing Stormfront, you may not be violating the law. Mm -hmm. But you may also be subject to intense public pressure, and yeah. this is this is not to obviate that the the the, you know, the need for a society to you know in other ways say hey we don't like that you shouldn't do it. But but we what they're saying is government should not get involved in this. It's important to remember that the reason 230 exists was a, a lawsuit against Prodigy. <laughs> That's how long ago this was. Yeah. Prodigy, in an effort to provide, and I'm reading from uh, Mike Masnick's excellent uh, post on techdirt.com. In order to provide a family-friendly environment, Prodigy did some moderation of its message boards. And, and in, the, uh, in the lawsuit, Stratton Oakmont versus Prodigy, 
uh, the judge ruled that since Prodigy did moderate the boards, it would be liable for anything it left up. At the time, the state of the law was such that that was the case. So Section 230 was written to explicitly overrule that judicial decision so that sites like Prodigy would not have liability if they moderated. It would give them the right to moderate without suddenly becoming a publisher. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important. Without that, I don't know if you have the Internet. You know, there are, there are a lot of lawsuits that were just preemptorily stopped because Section 230, nope, you cannot sue uh, Twitter for something uh, Lisa's husband posts on there, you know, <laughs> right? Mark Zuckerberg can't come up, uh, come, come after Twitter for that. And that's right. That's the way it should be. Yeah. It, it, he does look like data. There's nothing Mark Zuckerberg can, <laughs> can do about it. Um, so we're, I, we're I think we got to be careful about here. modifying it. I, I really yeah. makes me nervous because it is pretty close to, I feel pretty close to perfect. But that's, I'm just arguing against you a little bit, Lindsay, on that. Oh, that's totally fair. It's a, I, I'm not even sure you're arguing against me. I'm, I'm kind of exploring in my own mind how, yeah. how do we fix the, the problem, which is rampant spread of misinformation and sometimes exactly. intentionally. Exactly. And we're not, we're not there yet. I think that business interests are, in this case, counter to public interests. Yes. And I just hope that conversation keeps going. Yeah. Well, there's no, no you, question You said in my what mind. I was kind of groping at, which is that there's no incentive for businesses to address this unless they're going to lose money. And to loop back to earlier co comments, once Facebook loses brand equity, they're going to get very, very interested in uh, addressing the public good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's no question in my mind that these guys have immense power. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if they should be regulated uh, or broken up, or I don't think those are good solutions either. That's the pr to me. This is the biggest problem, uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna include Google in this, Facebook, Amazon. I'm gonna throw in here. Um, they have you know tw Twitter less so. <laughs> to be honest, it's only a few hundred million people. It's not that big a deal. <laughs> <laughs> and YouTube, uh, these guys have immense power. And uh, I think you could make the case that if, if Mark Zuckerberg decided he wanted candidate A to be the next president, he'd have a lot of ability to sway the country. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. He could do it. Mm -hmm. Do we want some one person to have that ability? And yet what is the governmental remedy for that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, this is a tough one. It's just, it, it's really hard stuff, and we haven't, we haven't quite figured it out yet. And that's why I scream in Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> that's all there is to it. That's the reason. All right, let's take a little bit break. This is the uh, the L word show. Lisa, <laughs> Leo, <laughs> Lindsay, and Lori. Uh, and I don't mean anything by that. I'm just saying. <laughs> oh. Brand new sponsor. I want to welcome Tibco uh, to the show. I had, I have to say, I had an education. I was spending some time with Tibco talking to them about what they do. And I was saying, well, what, <laughs> what is it you do? And I think it's really important to understand how important a company like Tibco is in the modern world world. If you're a, and I can, I can actually, I think I can do this by giving you some examples. If you're a company uh, nowadays, everything's instrumented. You know, you've got lots of information flooding in from your factories, from your stores, from your customers, tons of information all the time that I think if you're an executive, you look at and you say, I know if I could just somehow m massage that information, connect that information, I could gain insights from it that would change how we do business. That's what TIBCO does. They, it, there are three pillars to TIBCO. They let you capture data, connect to that data, unify it, and then predict based on that data. Take an example, Panera. You know Panera. Everybody knows Panera. So Panera's got a problem. It's called COVID-19. All of a sudden, these stores that were vibrant, thriving, people coming and going, nobody's coming in anymore. Nobody can come in anymore. So Panera needed to know, what do we do to change our business? They had the data. They used TIBCO to unify the data, to analyze it, 
And they were able to figure out, oh, I know what we do. We create Panera Bread Grocery. And they knew exactly what menu items, what, what, what products to cook, and what they could sell. They were able to diversify their business during quarantine because they had a solid, flexible master data management foundation from Tibco. It supported quick updates, new product additions. You know the name Tibco, I'm betting. You've probably seen it on their Mercedes-AMG Patronus F1 team, right? Seven world championships. That's another good example of a huge amount of data. An F1, Formula One race car, is instrumented to the to the ninth level. I mean, every single thing on that car is sending out megabytes of information every second. Tons of information. How do you use that information to tell you how to drive the car, how to tune the car, how to handle the next race? With TIBCO's deep technical expertise in connecting disparate systems, unifying the data, and then predicting outcomes with advanced analytics, they won seven world championships. For the University of Iowa, their hospital and clinics, they were able to use the data gathered from surgeries from patients and they were, they were able to reduce their surgical site infections by 74%. That's what analytics can do for you. That's what TIBCO can do for you. They solve tomorrow's impossible business problems by connecting, seamlessly connecting any application device or data source. That's the first pillar. Intelligently unifying that data so you have better access, trust, and control of it. That's the second pillar. And then confidently predicting business outcomes with real-time data-driven intelligence. This is business intelligence to the nth degree. This is the next level. TIBCO gives businesses the things they need, the information they need to succeed. Data is, there's no question about it, the transformative energy of the modern enterprise. And TIBCO is there to help its customers unlock the value of their real-time data to create a competitive asset. Think there's nothing more real-time than the data coming into an F1 race car constant flow of data, real time. Tibco can set it up so that they, you can analyze that and use it and get those insights. Fuel the modern enterprise through Tibco's connected intelligence. You want to know more about Tibco and how they unlock the value of your company's real time data? T-I-B-C-O Tibco.com slash podcast. That's Tibco.com slash podcast. Really interesting company. I spent uh, almost an hour talking to them about all the different things they are capable of doing. And I was blown away. 14 leadership positions from top industry analysts, including Gartner. They are the kings of this. They are huge in the digital economy. You need them. Tibco, T-I-B-C-O dot com slash podcast. And we thank them so much for supporting This Week in Tech. Sometimes I wish I had Tibco to help me understand what's going on in this world around us. It is, it is a wild ride. Uh, all right, we're done with Congress, <laughs> if only. I'm done with Congress. If only. <laughs> uh, moving, moving on to uh, other, other shores. Uh, let me see. There's so many things we could talk about today. It's really nice to have the three of you here. And I don't, I don't want anybody to think that we said, oh, let's get all women on. But it, but it happened. And you know what? I think it's working out pretty well. Lori mm -hmm. Gill from uh, MacBreak Weekly, and of course, iMore.com. Uh, uh, Lisa Schmeisner from uh, the IT Pro Today team. She's <laughs> editor there. Elle Schmeiser on the Twitter, and Lindsay Turrentine. Big shot, SVP in content and audience at CNET. All right, let's, you know, everybody is worried in the uh, audience. When's Leo going to bring up the M1 chip? <laughs> <laughs> they, Hello. <laughs> Hello, Craig. They won. <laughs> Hello, Craig. Uh, that's going to be an iconic shot, isn't it? Of Craig Frederick. Oh, you know it. Yeah. We're going to see memes of that so soon. <laughs> like, like legit memes. Like, it's going to happen real, oh, real soon. Oh, my God. <laughs> Have you had hair already? like that? Uh, You've yeah, got to well, have that photo. <laughs> the, yeah. that, the premise of that in the Apple video last week. <laughs> it's like week, a Pulp Fiction still. Like it is, isn't it? it? It's just wild. <laughs> was the instant on, on on Mac laptops. The funny thing is... Mac laptops are, have always been instant on. I have never had a delay to opening up the Mac laptop. I don't know why they decided to pick that. There's so many other things you could talk. But I did want to point out there have been a couple of really useful articles in the aftermath of this. What happens with any Apple event, at least it does for me, 
even without Steve Jobs, there is a reality distortion field. They're so good at marketing that you watch this and you're and you start drooling and you say, "I got, I don't, I gotta have that. I want to have that." <laughs> so it's really important to step back after that and say, "Okay, but really, what is it? Is it gonna? What's the difference gonna be?" We're and also, of course, for everybody, independent press to get and users to get their hands on these devices and see what they really are like in the real world. So a couple of things have been happening over the last two weeks. First of all, people are getting their new MacBook Airs or MacBook Pros or new Mac Minis with the M1 chip. And there has been, in general, huge excitement. People are saying, this thing is, these are fast. These are these are this is battery life that to die for. These are really nice machines with none of the flaws people were worried about with the first generation product. And then the next thing that's happened is I think some very good journalists have stepped up. Ars Technica had a great piece with Craig Federighi, Johnny Sarugi, and um, who else? There was a third person uh, in there talking about the process of design. And Ohm Malik, who I always I miss Giga Ohm. Mm -hmm. And Ohm is, you know, now he's a VC, but he's still got that journalist hat on. He spent some time talking about uh, the M1 chip and some really interesting conversations uh, about what it means. And he said, and I think this is uh, kind of true, that this is, this is really what, from day one, uh, Steve Jobs was aiming for. This was... He, they, he calls it Steve Jobs' last gambit. Uh, we're learning that Apple's been planning this for years, at least three years. It takes three years for them to conceive of a chip to, from then to shipping it. Um, and so they're aiming some degree into the future. Um, I also think, and this is, again, taking off from Ohm, the M1 is a, is, is a I think, a... Uh, a phase change in desktop computing that something has happened that will ch that will change Intel that will change AMD that will change Windows forever one of the things he says chips have become so complex that you need integration and specialization to create better performance and control power consumption that's one of the advantages Apple has they do the software they do the hardware and they do all the hardware now he also says, and I thought this was interesting when I saw the chip, a huge amount of it is devoted to machine learning. He said machine learning will define the capabilities of software in the future. The unified memory architecture, which means RAM is much faster, perhaps more efficient. Uh, you may not need as much RAM. And it, talk me off the ledge. Now, I'm not going to ask Lori to do this because we've been talking <laughs> about I'm this. Because I'm going to push you right I know. Over. <laughs> you're going to push me off. But, but Lindsay and Lisa... Talk me off the ledge here. Am I nuts to think that this is? I'll start with you, Lindsay, because you you look at the mm -hmm. you look at the industry as a whole, and then I'll and then I'll go to uh, Lisa because she's a Windows person. <laughs> do you think <laughs> do you think this is that kind of a phase change, uh, a, an inflection point in technology? Is that too much to say? I think it's going to take time, but it will be after a couple of years. Yeah. Um, these, you know, just from a practical standpoint, anytime Apple changes something in a big way, it takes a few years to get enough adoption and, and enough apps out there in the ecosystem to take advantage of it, that it, it just, it takes time. Uh, I think that enough creators have this hardware and will buy this hardware that it will create change necessarily. It always does. And, and, and you make an excellent point. I mean, people, I'm getting mine tomorrow, but people have taken theirs mm -hmm. home already are pointing out there's a lot of software uh, that is not native. Hu surprisingly mm -hmm. large amount is, but still quite a bit of important programs aren't native. And there's some stuff that doesn't work at all. Well, the Adobe apps aren't all ready yet. There's a I mean, beta, sh beta of Photoshop that is, and they say Lightroom next month. Yep, but so, Illustrator, Premiere, not, there's so a lot of creators stuff still are not to come. ready yet. Yep. They're not going to get what they need quite yet, so they're going to wait. I mean, so years and years ago, David Carnoy, who's a, a tenured reviewer at CNET, convinced me, and I've stuck with it, never, ever buy a first-gen Apple product. Yeah, that's unless, the conventional unless wisdom. You wanna, unless you want to be a tester. I've broken that rule a few times and regretted it. Mm -hmm. Not because the products were bad, but because you realize that they were fine, but the next generation is going to be 
really darn good. There's the actually part. no question about that. The M2, the M3, the M4, if this chip is this good, will be amazing, right? So there, it, there would be good reason if you could wait to wait, I guess. Yeah, um, although I am feeling, I will admit, I bought a MacBook right before this. Yeah, see, I told, <laughs> I told no, everybody. Sorry. Knowing that it was coming. I said, knowing. do yeah. not. Do not buy an Intel device now. Yeah. That's a mistake, I said. Yeah. I did, and it was a little bit of money saving, a little bit of skepticism, like, hey, well, I'm not going to buy the first generation anyway, and I need a new laptop, and now I'm feeling kind of sad about it. So, you know, oh. I'm, I'm contradicting myself. The other thing that's important <laughs> is that as much as Microsoft would love to do this, <laughs> they can't. Uh, they can't design their own chips because they've got OEMs. They've got Lenovo and Dell and HP and everybody's making these. They can't do suddenly do what Apple's done and said, no, go, we're going to use Microsoft chips. No, they can't. They have uh, no. Windows historically's biggest uh, boat anchor has been legacy. They're not going <laughs> to abandon legacy. Apple does for some reason. They don't seem, I guess because they have a tiny market share, they don't seem <laughs> to mind cutting people off at the knees and saying, sorry, the future is now. Mm -hmm. Microsoft never does that. And yet, I have to think, if you're a Windows laptop user, you're looking over the fence at 22-hour battery life, at better mm. performance, and, and, and saying, <laughs> so what do you, so, so tell me from on the other side of the fence, Lisa, uh, how does it look uh, over you, there? That was a good setup. <laughs> I, you know, I think, um, Unless you're on a computer for 22 hours straight, um, you know, battery life is is going to be a lot more personal. Um, I think the the thing that made me sit up and pay attention was actually in TechCrunch, where the reviewer said, "Oh, this thing works like an iPad." Matthew Panzerino, and, yeah, yeah, and then said the click is responsive, every interaction is immediate, it feels like an iOS device in the best way. And the reason I thought that was really important is because it points to a trend that we're actually seeing on the Windows side too, which is the notion that computing is um, not going to be based on the model that we're used to where the keyboard and the mouse are your primary sources of input and data manipulation and data access. We're moving to a model where it's going to be tactile and immediate and you and your data are going to flow between, uh, you know, your mobile device and your laptop device and back and forth. And I thought it was interesting that Apple is massaging and amplifying user expectations for a shift that's already in progress and a shift that's already been happening with people who are hardcore surface, surface users for, for quite a while. Um, and there's also, it feels like to some degree, Microsoft prepared for this in an interesting way because uh, starting next year, they're going to be selling a product where you're not even running Windows locally. You're running it in the cloud. Yeah, no, desktop as a service is a huge and growing market for enterprise folks. And it's gotten a real boost from, well, 2020 because when any enterprise is faced with having to support people virtually instead of being able to just like walk over and see why somebody is hitting the restart button repeatedly and not getting to bring it up, you know, uh, DAS, it's just, you can pop in, see what they're doing, reconfigure things, reboot it for them, um, get it going. And, you know, Microsoft was, it, I guess the best way to put it is, you know, Microsoft's like, yes, this is going to be a thing. Yes, we've already they've they've already got a really strong cloud-based position, and they've seen phenomenal growth in their cloud-based services for the enterprise. Like, not just Azure, we're talking like Office 365 has been great for them too, and this is another logical outgrowth of that. Where if, if I get can, a customer to pay for a service rather than a license, yeah. if I could pay, play Cyberpunk 2077 on an mm -hmm. Android phone or a Chromebook. Yeah. on Google Stadia, why the hell do I need to have Windows running on a machine? Yeah, uh, exactly. Which, in some ways, it almost feels like Apple might have made a, a strategic mistake. They focused on making a more powerful desktop while Microsoft focused on <laughs> running wherever y you are, right? But are they really aiming at the same audience? Um, you, for all that we're sitting here talking about this, you know, my, a lot of Microsoft's bread and butter is in really... Um, almost boring or, uh, you know, we run the world type places like hospital offices right. or school administrations, yeah. things like that. Yeah. And Apple's done a really good job of colonizing a much different set of offices and industry verticals. So 
I don't know if you can necessarily compare them one to one anymore. They're very different companies in a lot of ways. Microsoft makes an increasing percentage of its revenue quarter over quarter based on cloud-based services and data manipulation, whereas Apple is beginning to move into consumer-based services and um, emphasis on wearables and phones and things like that. Um, so maybe they're instead not- of they're not. They're, it, you can't really do business parity, in my opinion. They're both part of like a personal computing ecosystem, yeah. but they have very different uh, functions. I mean, it's the same thing. You can have, um, to, to use another metaphor, you can have like your KitchenAid mixer and you can have your coffee maker and both of them can be beautifully designed and do what they're going to do, but you can't interchange them. You can't <laughs> make coffee point. in a... In a five quart mixer. <laughs> no, nobody says, gee, I wish I had a burr grinder in my KitchenAid. It's yeah. not, yeah. So maybe it's better to say instead of an inflection point, well, we're at a fork in the road where computing is going to take two different uh, directions. Is that a fair? Yeah. Um, now, bear in mind, this is just a personal opinion. And this is also based on, you know, watching trends in the enterprise and things like that. If you are an end user, you're probably going to conceive of computing as this is the collection of data and experiences and apps that are in my personal cloud. And I access them through any one of a wide variety of hardware devices. Um, for the companies, it's going to be a slightly different relationship where they're like, these are going to be the services we offer and these are the devices and appliances we offer and these are the configurations we offer. And um, you're not going to have people locked into different platforms. You're going to have them maybe locked into different services based on how easy it is to move their stuff around and access it. But if if somebody is an Apple partisan, it's it's not, oh, I, I only store things in iCloud. I never use Google Drive or Gmail. Like, that's just not how it works. No, it isn't. <laughs> No, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually, Lori, it may not be a bad thing if I have an Apple computer for my as a consumer for my stuff that I'm doing locally and that I that's my product. I and you know, there's been a lot of questions. Well, what about boot camp? Will I be able to run Windows on this? In fact, uh, in the Ars Technica article, uh, I think Craig Fagerlugi <laughs> said that's up to Microsoft. They got to figure that out. We're not going to. It's not our job to get Windows running on our new Macintoshes. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the answer is I don't run Windows on my Macintosh. I run Windows Virtual Desktop in a yeah. browser, and now I have everything I want. I have a cloud. Mm -hmm. I have I have Windows. I have a, a personal device that is aesthetic and beautiful and powerful. I get everything I want. Is that? And I, I haven't used a virtual machine yet. I'm, I'm testing out the MacBook Pro right now. And one of the things I need to do is test out a virtual machine on it. But from what I understand, the issues with other Macs having a little bit of lag using virtual machines goes away completely with the M1 chip. So, right. you know, that's the pain point that people would say, well, that I use bootcamp because I don't like the Mac operating system. I only, I want the hardware that is the Mac, but I want the software that is Windows. And, you know, let's see, maybe the virtual machine is the is the solution to that at least temporarily while while boot camp is not you know working for the M1 chip. Lisa, so. does Windows Virtual Desktop run? It runs in a browser, right? You would just do, is, or do you have a client app? How does that work? Do you know? <laughs> you know, you asked me, and I haven't actually had any hands on time with it. <laughs> well, nobody has. It comes out next year. Um, I mean, I I, I would in theory yeah. you could run it in a browser. Here's what yeah. I find really interesting. Uh, while a number of manufacturers, yeah. uh, including Microsoft, have been, mm -hmm. you know, said, well, we're going to embrace the M1 chip, but we're not going to do it right away. Or, you know, uh, Office is currently in beta. Google, mm -hmm. within days, said, oh, here's Chrome. <laughs> and I yeah. thought about it and I realized that's actually because I think Google sees Chrome as the window into Windows Virtual Desktop. I know they see Chrome as the window into Stadia. People complain, oh, my M1, it's not going to play video games. It doesn't have a discrete GPU. Who cares? You're going to be running. Uh, I, I, mean, I just, when that hit me, I thought, I don't have to worry about native games on my Mac, on my new Mac, because I'm going to run Chrome native, and it's going to use WebSM or whatever uh, technologies, mm -hmm. PWA technologies it uses to, and I can play Fortnite. I could play, I ordered pre ordered Cyberpunk 2077. Mm -hmm. I could play all of that. Because it's it's not running on the machine. It's running in the cloud. I'm streaming it to a browser. I think that's, to me, that's why I think this is a sea change. And I don't know what it's gonna, how it's going to shake out. But I think you, I think you actually, you nailed it, Lisa, by saying 
yours is a personal thing, like my wristwatch is a, you know, or a piece of jewelry is a personal object, a commodity that's mine, my phone. But it's a window into a larger tool set that is actually probably in the cloud, much of it, right? And this, this is Microsoft's perfectly positioned for that. All right. Nothing to say. I'm going to take a break. <laughs> I knew this wouldn't go anywhere. I just try. I try. That's all. I'm trying to bring up, trying to bring up the M1. You know, the chat room's going, no! <laughs> don't let Leo talk about it anymore. They're sick to death of it. They don't want to hear any more about it. Let me talk about LastPass. Uh, mm -hmm. Our sponsor, they sponsor the studio. Uh, this has been, 2020 has been a tough year for everybody, including us. But I want to thank LastPass because thanks to you, LastPass, we've been able to keep the lights on and the shows rolling. LastPass does more than that. LastPass protects our most vital assets, our data. You don't want to trust your bank accounts, your websites, your customer databases to just any company. That's why LastPass has been our choice for identity and access management for years. I started using LastPass 12 years ago as my password manager. About six years ago, we started using LastPass Enterprise for Twit. Uh, and I'm not alone in loving LastPass. In the uh, G2 Fall Grid reports, that's a peer-to-peer -peer review site. 746 customers left user reviews, 93% of them four or five stars. People love LastPass. You know who's going to also love LastPass? Your IT department and your security folks, because it lets you take control back of your password security. You've got a central dashboard. You can see exactly what's going on in your business, company-wide visibility. It'll not just show you who's using what, when, and where, but it'll even show you how you're progressing. For every employee, you can view their password scores. You can gain access to shared accounts, monitor group memberships, and more. You get visibility into what people are doing with those most vital resources. You get complete control of privileges. You can customize admin privileges. For instance, we have a business department that uses LastPass to ac access the bank accounts, things like that, QuickBooks. We can have an administrator administrator there that can access all of that but can't get into our operations uh, department because, you know, you've got to kind of partition everything out. No matter what your organization's source of truth, LastPass will integrate to onboard users, to sync groups, to revoke access when it's time to do that. You get complete audit reports that help you build compliance and maintain accountability, detailed reporting logs that Tie actions to individuals, because that's really what you need. You need to see what your, your users, especially when your employees are working from home, what are they doing? What are they accessing? And making sure with multi-factor authentication that only the right people are accessing those resources. MFA goes beyond simple two-step. You've got, of course, the biometrics, the, the fingerprint or the face recognition or the iris recognition. But in addition to that, you have contextual multi-factor, things like geolocation and IP address. Your company can enable and require MFA. We do. You get 100-plus policies. Uh, we make sure that everybody uses two-factor. We make sure there's a minimum password requirements, lots of advanced security features. Or if you want to make it simple, it, it, out of the box, LastPass is configured for a perfect balance between convenience and security. The point is you get control. You can do whatever you need to do to make LastPass work for you. And, of course, when you're creating LastPass, uh, passwords that that password generator does long strong randomized passwords uh, keeps track of them for you and and 1200 plus single sign-on apps eight awards so far for last pass this year pc magazine's editor's choice fortress Cybersecurity award business insider's best overall password manager that's just a few i love last pass i use it i'm dedicated devoted to it and so is our company i think you'll feel the same way Take control of your password security. Go to lastpass.com slash twit. Lastpass.com slash twit. Now more than ever, with employees working from home, people all, all over the place, you need to take control of your identity and access management. Do it with LastPass. Uh, speaking of encryption, Google is now rolling out end-to-end -end encryption default in RCS. This, I don't know if... Are you guys up on RCS if you want to talk about this? It's kind of an inside baseball thing. But it's I don't know much about the details about it, but mm -hmm. I 
kind of a little bit understand generally the the overarching idea behind it, which is the we're talking about AMP, right? We're talking about the Google. No, 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 no. RCS is oh. is is rich communication services. Basically, we're talking about Google's response to Apple's messages. So oh, oh, oh. Apple has yeah. never, of course, put messages anywhere but on Apple devices. Mm -hmm. But people want the features that Apple's messages offer. Uh, Google was hoping that they could get the mobile carriers to do this. Mobile carriers like SMS, nobody else does. Uh, and, and the carriers really dragged their feet. So last year, Google finally threw up their hands and said, fine, <laughs> we'll do it. Uh, they actually bought a company that did RCS. Uh, and as of this week, Google completed a rollout of RCS for all Android phones using Android Messenger. Uh, or I guess they call it Google Messages. I don't know. You never know with Google what the hell their messaging platform is. But I guess it's now Google Messages. Uh, it has RCS and they are uh, starting to put in end-to-end -end encryption as well. And the problem is on Apple, you're still a green bubble. Doesn't matter what you do. If you're on Android, you're a damn green bubble and you're, and you're discriminated against. And Apple's not going to ever put Apple's messages on Android. And I just, it's a shame because it feels like it's siloed in both cases, mostly because of it Apple. is. Yeah. And it has become, you're right, is 100% become a social thing. Mm -hmm. And I, without naming the teenager in question. <laughs> <laughs> is it one you own or one you rent? It's what I own. <laughs> and this one um, changed his entire platform because of not wanting to be a green bubble. Yeah. He's like, I'm literally yeah. getting left out of conversations with my friends. Yeah. Especially group conversations. Yeah. So Google has its own group chat. But if you're on an Android device and your friends are on <laughs> messages from Apple, you're just kind of, you're left. They don't even say, don't, don't let him yeah. in the group. It's just going to mess it up. My brother's on an Android device. My mom is on an Apple device. And uh, he's a little salty about the fact that... <laughs> is that you're not talking to me. Well, yeah. I'd love to have him um, on a platform where I could loop him right in and message it too. I, I don't think it's just Android users who are out in the cold on this. Um it's frankly a little bit silly that my ability to create group chats and give them funky names and drop and drag stuff and ping people on either my desktop or my iPad or my phone. Um, I don't like that it leaves out a lot of people that I know. Yeah. <laughs> but is if it is solution? driving purchases, which yeah. it is clearly since I like, mm -hmm. it's they have driving no incentive purchases. to it, do they? No That's incentive. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so horrible. These poor Android people are going to be all. Oh, is man. is the solution telling all your friends? Does this work? To, uh, I don't know. To use Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp or how, how do people? No, no, I don't Facebook know. Messenger, I mean, no. it, it, it has become because it has become a strange status and social thing. There's mm -hmm. eye rolling. I mean, I always go to the young people. <laughs> I sound so old. No, no, people. you're not. First of all, uh, no, you're sitting next you to an old man, so you'll always look young. But also, this is the way it is. It's not, it's young people are the ones who are kind of solving this unilaterally, forcing us older yeah. people to go along for the ride. Well, you right? know, you know what they, they, they are all actually all, they're just going to Discord. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, in in reality, that's maybe that's the future. It's not going to be Android or iOS or one messaging platform or another that fixes this. It's going to be a complete third party, and that's how they talk to each other. You know what's good about they're that? They're on Discord servers, and they, they mom's that's... not on Discord. No, actually, Some okay. Family One really funny story. <laughs> I am on Discord, and the reason I'm on Discord oh. is because I couldn't get my kids to text me back. <laughs> so I joined, I joined Discord, and I my username is your mom. And I friended one of my children and he came back to me and was like, LOL, ha ha ha. And I'm like, no, really, I'm your mom. Oh my God. And he was like, oh, I thought you were just somebody, like a friend of mine trolling me. And then both of my kids have been like, this is great. Oh. It's so easy to get in touch with you. Oh, <laughs> well, I don't care what the platform you. is. Can we just all agree? I, it's fine with me. Let's go Discord, everybody. Discord is it. Yeah. That's where the kids are. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just like you're saying, Lindsay, on the one hand, there is this sort of like status pressure, the, you know, green bubble, blue bubble situation. But um, that's not like it, it, the kids are going to go where they're going to go. And and it doesn't matter whether Android has a messages app. It doesn't matter whether Apple has a messages app. It's really they're going to find their own ways to like have group conversations and chats and things like that. And it's going to change right now. It's Discord. It'll be something else in a year or two. That's that's, that's the, the problem with thing, the Utes so. is they just they, they're <laughs> they're fickle. They're fickle. Well, I feel like you can watch the Utes, as it were, to to <laughs> see where they're going with communications preferences and technologies mm-hmm. and how that's going to shape things in the workplace yeah. down the line. And the fact that they're so into Discord now, like. Wait till Discord hits the enterprise in about five to six years. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the funny thing yeah. is that my kids, one of my uh-huh. kids actually wrote a letter to the principal of his high school to try to convince the high school to use Discord what? instead of Zoom for virtual teaching. Oh, I guess you could, right? You could. Can yeah. you do in yeah. Discord everything you yeah. do in, in uh, Zoom or Teams or Skype? It's or very much like Slack. Yeah. It's like mm-hmm. Slack, mm-hmm. but with more voice emphasis. Yeah. I'm not completely ignorant. I have a Discord account. I created one so that I could uh, play on the Vatican's Minecraft server. Yeah. But well, this may explain why Slack is um, boosting its ability to leave like little audio snippets and, and things like that there too, as they recognize where that audience is coming from. So oh my gosh. Uh, tell me mm-hmm. now, if I use Discord, could I... See, this is a- Apple again. They don't let you say, I don't want to use messages as my default. They don't you can't mm-hmm. change that. No, yeah, that that yeah, yeah. that's never gonna change. Apple's not gonna let that happen. That's too bad because <laughs> yeah. that means I'm kind of stuck still on an iPhone using messages. Until somebody does a gateway or something. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a messages to Discord gateway. Isn't this a little bit of the risk Apple faces by not opening up messages that somebody's going to come along, be cross-platform and just take the market away from them? Is that a... So I think the the problem is, for, from my perspective, and maybe this isn't the way everybody uses their devices, but the, the, the messages app on iPhone is the default messages app. And that's why I use it. It has nothing to do with where my friends are, what platforms they use. It's the text messaging app thing for the phones. You know, I'm, I'm old enough that there was just text messaging back then. And so that's my, that's default where I go. So I have, you know, a number of different ways that I chat with people, Slack and discord and all these other things. But if I want to talk to a person, I just go to the thing where I text message people, which on the phone (laughs) is, is is the messages Mm -hmm. app. I don't think it's a, it's a competition type thing. If I was on an Android phone, that is the thing that I would use to text message people. It's just how I think of it. I, I, and I really do like, again, I'm going back to the, it's a, it's really a status thing when you can say I've got the blue bubble. I don't think it's that the messages app is so great. And doesn't everybody wish they had something similar? No, everybody just wants a blue bubble. That's all it is. You know, it is, uh, there any chance Apple will adopt, uh, RCS? No. They don't need RCS. They have all the features of RCS in their siloed app. It's market pressures. You know, so what can convince? See, so this is a mess. That's the problem. It's too, it's too fragmented a market for any one thing, even in Google's RCS, to threaten Apple's messages. So they could just sit back and say, yeah, fine, have fun. But you know what they should do and they might do because the user experience is important to Apple and what they should do and hopefully would do is make the kind of features that interact with Android devices, for example, a lot easier. So renaming a group message or tap backs mm-hmm. that, um, you know, make sense to an Android user or, um, you know, being able to um, pin um, the the group message that has an Android user in it. Like if Apple could on the iPhones and make the interaction Uh, with Android users, a better experience for the iPhone user, they don't, they don't need to worry about what the Android user thinks, but they need to worry about what I think. And if it's frustrating to me that I can't have the same kind of experience with my friends who use Android, I'm mad at Apple. I'm not mad at Android. So I think it would be good for them to make some changes. Is Apple doing this to make it, for ecosystem lock-in, is it is it com- just anti-competitive that they're saying nope, not going to do it? 
Can't, you can't change your defa def default messenger. We're not going to incorporate these features. It's us or uh, our way or the highway. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think this, that is in this case. And it's because you can use any other messaging app that you want. So they don't lock you into messages. It, it, you can at any point in time open up the Discord app and use that. You can, you can hide the, the messages app and put Discord right there on your main page and be that, make that be the thing that you always open. Um, it, you can make it your default messaging app by just not using the other service. So I don't think it's really a lock-in sort of anti-competitive situation for this particular thing. I think it's really just an issue of, it's been such a, a nice, pleasurable experience for iPhone users for so long that it's kind of a joke now. And people, you know, people want to make fun of Android's lack of, of that kind of feature. And, um, and then again, you know, like I was saying, there's the user experience from the perspective of an iPhone user, but that that's it's really not that big of a of a deal, you know. Are you are you all iPhone users? Anybody use yes. Android? No, nope, all iPhone users. See, I think yep. whether Apple's doing it intentionally or not, it does have that impact because the I don't I you know I fell in love with Telegram. I wanted everybody to use Telegram. I've gone through all these stages. I, AOL, Instant Messenger. Anybody remember that? Mm -hmm. But eventually, I just gave in. I just sank into the warm bath that is the Apple <laughs> ecosystem. <laughs> and, right? But didn't we all do that? Yeah. It's like ah, uh, just use messages. <laughs> yes, we did. And that's why I, I do maintain that it, it may not be anti-competitive because there are, are alternatives, but it's definitely a market share move. Yeah. I think people do, like your, was it you who were saying that one of you, or maybe it was Lisa? One of my kids. One of your kids said, just said, we don't, you know, get a, get a, get a real phone. <laughs> we, we don't, yeah. Well, my son I'm trying was, to tell my brother that too, so that he can get a real family phone. chat. Yeah, no. just don't you want to be in the family? <laughs> what do you hate but us? But you can, but you can be in the family chat. It's just from your perspective on your phone, yeah. mm -hmm. you can't rename the conversation and all the yeah. fun things. So it's really it's you, not your brother, right? Like your yeah. brother's yeah. like, what? I'm just just. But text then it me. may make your choices exclusionary. I mean, what was actually happening with these teenagers was that they were leaving people out of the group right. chats because they were green bubbles. We don't want you And in they wanted to keep wow. the group all yeah. blue because the functionality was different and it annoyed them. That's right. So they just ditched the yeah. people who were green. Do you lose I mean, some exactly things with it. green bubbles in there. It's not like you I can mean, do it. I mean, the thing is, is, is I chat with my mom She'll ping me when I'm at work in the middle of the day, and it's easier for me to just – I'm on my laptop. I can look something up, drop it back into her chat, and it's done. And that's so easy. I love that I can just mm -hmm. move between things that have keyboards and things that are mobile devices, whereas if it's the family chat with my brother, I can only access that on the phone. And but you can you can turn on um you can turn on uh, continuity and and use your computer as as a phone and, and receive those text messages. So another you are reason of doing that. Another reason why you should probably be running a Macintosh computer as well as an iPhone. <laughs> you see, you see how that happens. Yes. Yeah. Just relax in the nice warm bath of Apple. <laughs> oh, it's, yeah. You know, put some bubbles in there. Enjoy. Light some candles. Some blue bubbles. No blue bubbles, uh, no green bubbles, only blue bubbles. <laughs> Just enjoy. I really do think it's it, it's it, it should it's something that Apple should work to make better for me, the Apple buyer, and all the people like me. It not mm -hmm. don't bring it to Android. Just make the iPhone a better user but experience honestly, for people who have to c have conversations with Android users, so that it's not an issue anymore. Do you think there's much pressure from Apple's users to do that? I don't care. Just get rid of the green bubbles. You're just not in my life. <laughs> but I do think, I think that you're right. It's not mean, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that there is, the reason that Apple needs to make it a better experience is because back to that earlier conversation, people are just going to leave texting altogether. Right. It's going to become, and, and I sort of noticed this happening already. Like that's just not where a lot of, a lot of the back and forth that I used to have with some people now happens in other apps mm -hmm. because it's more cumbersome to do it via text for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're talking about these like microscopic choices of, of like 
that really is deciding between something that's going to take you five milliseconds and something that's going to take you seven milliseconds. <laughs> um, it, it seems kind of like a silly decision, but these things happen over time and you move toward the system that is more um, frictionless. Mm-hmm. And if people stop texting, it won't really matter to Apple and it'll hurt them in the long run. So anyway. They should work on making it better. So there, but I there will be a don't. business consequence to Apple if they don't realize this at some point. I think so. People <laughs> won't care about the blue bubbles because they won't be using any bubbles. You know, the only <clears throat> seemed like the only company that could at this point be competitive was Zoom. Could Zoom do all of the? They don't. They don't have a messaging capability really. They need Not to really. work on that. Or is that where maybe that's where Slack and Skype and Teams went wrong? Is by putting too much stuff in no nobody else is competing well i think back to it's discord and slack mm -hmm. for a lot of people <clears throat> yeah like a lot of people who used to text me in, for work reasons now use slack so tell me on yeah. uh tell me on discord you have to create a family group though right discord is all group related so you, it's it, very much like Slack. You can create a Discord server. So the, so the kids, they're, they're all into creating they're, servers. They're they learned that from Minecraft. Right. So they create Discord servers. Um, but you can do group chats. You can have one-on-one -on -one conversations. And a lot of it, and then you can switch seamlessly to voice, which is why a lot of them use it. It uh -huh. started as a gaming platform. Yeah, I know. So gamers I remember. would use yeah. it to have yeah. you know, voice conversation. It feels like, it feels so, it feels like, so email was originally like this. Nobody remembers mm -hmm. this, but in, you know, you, if you had MCI mail, you couldn't you couldn't email somebody with Genie or CompuServe. Mm -hmm. It just they didn't go. And eventually, we said that's stupid. We should federate, and everybody should be able to email everybody. We solved it. It went away. Then, but then there was then the message wars began, and for <laughs> a little while we had, I mean, AOL's Instant Messenger was I no ICQ was the first. Then there was AIM, and and for a while there were programs that would let you do all of them like pigeon and stuff mm -hmm. yeah and then they changed the protocols because they didn't want that and as a result that was a mistake they faded away whatever happened to icq and aim uh they shut the servers down they're over but we're still in that same tower of babel that we were in 20 years ago mm -hmm. where all these we have all these messenger platforms the names have changed but the same it's the same experience from the point of view of the user. You have to figure out, well, what platform is dad on and how can I message Joey? Mm. I wish we, remember Trillion? <laughs> I wish we had, mm -hmm. what do we, how do we yeah. solve this? It's not a good solution. Trillion was too early. I think <laughs> it, it is being solved in a similar way now, just in at a time when people are ready for it because their connections are faster mm -hmm. and, and they're more used to, and, and it, app infrastructure is just easier now. Doesn't Discord also have kind of a bad boy feel to it? I don't, you know, I don't, look, I will be really transparent here. I, everything I know about it comes from just a couple of very small conversations that I have on it and I'm not deep in it, but, uh, I feel like is, it's it where is, hackers hang out. It's a lot. It is really well moderated is my oh, perception okay. Okay. that, um, people take their discord server moderation very seriously and it's in discord's best interest to prevent nefarious stuff from happening because so many kids are on it yeah. the second some legislature finds out that bad crap is happening on discord Ooh. it'll be bad so they I, I, I get the impression that it's actually pretty well regulated internally all right take a little break i want to take you back in time when we come back Mm. As Flash, there's actually two big deals going on. Flash has gone by the wayside. This is it for Flash. One more month. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and it is the 35th anniversary of a technology that changed the world. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. Our show today brought to you quite literally by our content delivery network, Cashfly. Cashfly has been around since 1999. We've been using them since we practically the very beginning. In the earliest days of the podcast, I was, you know, letting people download it from a website. That didn't work out so well. Then I tried BitTorrent. I, had, I remember the days when I'd come, you know, the show would be over. I said, okay, please seed us so everybody can download it. It was a pain. Finally, Matt Levine of Cashfly, one of the founders, came along and said, Leo, try Cashfly. And it has been such a burden off my shoulders. Cashfly 
brings our content closer to the users. So when you download the show, it's faster. It, it's instantaneous. Because there's so many servers all over the world, you never have to worry about the servers down. People can't get the show. There's a 100% SLA guarantee from Cashfly. That's awesome. Uh, I, I never get the 3M call, you know. Oh, the server's down. I have to log in and make sure I haven't exceeded my capacity, that kind of thing. I just love it. But there is one little thing uh, that uh, any CDN has to deal with. It's a caching server. So when you put up a new show, the first thing that has to happen is the, the various servers all over the world, when somebody hits it and says, I want the latest edition of Twit, that server says, I don't have it, and has to go back to the source and get it. And that could be a real problem for you, downloading from the origin. That's what we call a cache miss. When there's a cache miss, they have to go to Amazon's S3 or wherever you store your content, download it. That slows it down for your users. It could cause buffering if you're streaming. It could be a real problem. It can also cost you a lot of money because sometimes the real expense is the, the, the cache miss where you've got data transfer out fields, feeds from S3 or whatever to get to your caching server. That's why ca we've been actually using this since almost since day one, but now Cashfly is offering this to everybody. Storage Optimization System, or SOS. It's a dedicated storage space on Cashfly. So when we upload our podcast, we don't upload it to S3. We upload it to Cashfly, which means your data and content is closer to your customers or your consumers you save thousands a month by shielding your origin cashfly guarantees no cash misses what does that mean no buffering no slowdowns your download speeds will be drastically improved and your data transfer out fees will be significantly reduced and you'll get a hundred percent cash hit ratio it is so awesome you're going to love SOS. It's just one more reason to use Cashfly. They've also, by the way, increased their pops. They just got six new points of presence in South America, which means they're now serving 10 times the amount of traffic in Latin America since last year. But, but not only is it not getting slower, they've actually drastically improved their performance in the region while they're taking on a much higher traffic load. We love it. We have listeners all over the world. And Cashfly serves them with servers near them. Whether your end users are in North America, Latin America, the Caribbean, Europe, the Middle East, Asia Pacific, your content is delivered quickly and reliably. You can expect consistency and performance everywhere in the world. And because of Cashfly's reliable throughput and scalability, they're as fast as 500% faster than other CDNs. So get SOS, get that 100% uptime SLA guaranteed, industry-leading global performance, stream, podcasts, videos, digital downloads to global audiences of any size. It's the best thing that ever happened to us. It should happen to you, too. And because of SOS, Cash Miss is delivered five times faster because you're getting it from the Cashfly network instead of some third party across the public internet. Cashfly, I want to congratulate them too. They're partnering with World Central Kitchen to help people in need. They've donated over $50,000, serving over 300,000 warm meals to people who are struggling in these difficult times. Great company, great people doing just what you need. Look at all the people who use Cashfly, including us. Uh, right now, if you want to know if Cashfly can save you, just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. Just bring your bill and your usage to twit.cashfly.com. Chances are you're, you're spending more than 20% more than you have to. Just find out. Go to twit.cashfly.com. No hard sell, just nice people who will help you get your content where it's going. Twit.cashfly.com. Thank you, Cashfly, for your support. <clears throat> Nobody's going to mourn Flash. Right? That's <laughs> uh, true. And, and thank you, Steve Jobs, because it really was Steve who wrote the letter, uh, public letter on the front page of Apple.com saying, we're not going to put Flash on our iPhone, and then later the iPad. It's over. Get over it. It took it more than 10 years to die. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the year, even Adobe finally says, it's over for Flash. Well, the Internet Archive is making sure it's not over for Flash. <laughs> uh, good they are, for the Internet Archive. Good for, you know what? I yeah. love the Internet Archive. Good for them. Yeah. They have decided that 
that now you don't, the beauty of this is you don't need Flash to see Flash on the Internet Archive. They're using WebSM and, an, and a Flash emulator called Ruffle uh, so that you can see Flash items. And ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself because <laughs> it's peanut butter jelly time. Let's let's just go back in time from the year 2000. There it is. <laughs> oh, remember that little that made me really happy. pixelated banana? Oh, man, you got to go to the Internet Archives Flash Archive because there's so many things that will make you happy. Remember... Oh, this? <laughs> what was wrong with us in in those days? We we were younger. What? I don't. <laughs> it's not that different now. I mean, now it's just no. this just happens in memes. It, it, yeah, yeah, you're right. But the, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe I'm getting old. But I feel like the memes aren't as good oh, as they radical. as they use. Oh, which one do you want to see? Oh my gosh! How about this one? Lock <laughs> happen. Someone set up a bond. We get signal. Lock. Main screen turn on. It's you. How are you, gentlemen? <laughs> All your base are belong to us. Now that's the that's the <laughs> meme that never never ended, right? The never ending <laughs> meme. Which one you want, Radiskull? Oh, I don't know if I'm ready for Radiskull. This oh, is the. Oh no! It's just <laughs> they had a whole like theme song and everything. It was unbelievable. Radiskull and Devil yeah. Doll. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Internet Archive, for keeping this stuff around. And you know what? Ruffle does a really good job uh, of of just uh, taking the SWF file and playing it smoothly, fluidly in your browser. No, no need. Here's remember Fly Guy. No need to uh, to install Flash in your browser. Um, this one doesn't have any audio, I don't think. But uh, this was a fun little. You could. This probably was the beginning of the dinosaur uh, animation, right? On uh, on Google, when you get a here's Fly Guy, and I can use the arrows to start flying. <laughs> Life was simpler in those days. It's so restful. <laughs> so restful. I remember this one. You remember this? I do not. I don't remember it. This, um, I don't, yeah, I mean, there's not much to it. That's, that's it just right a there. fly guy. 2002, 18 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. I just had to do that. I had to punish you with that. Uh, oh, and there's one other thing. It was on November 20th. I bet you Lisa will know this one. Uh, uh -huh. November 20th, 35 years ago, 1985, what, what happened that changed the world forever? It was the release of Windows 1.0. Uh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> uh, which was, by the way, barely Windows. It was really a mm. shell on top of DOS for many, many years. Mm. Version 1. November 20th, 1985. Wow. Yeah. And uh, that gave rise to a few articles. Here's one. Uh, happy birthday to Windows showing. Oh, that was it. Nope, maybe that's not it. A few articles showing the old user interface. Boy, it was ugly. <laughs> <sighs> it was really bad. Yes. Um, did you celebrate at Windows IT Pro? Did you even know that that anniversary happened? I don't think we did. Um, See, possibly. You got to listen to Twit because that's where that's where all the stuff is happening. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I think one of the reasons we didn't also is um, for the last few years, one of the stories that we've been following is Microsoft's persistent downplaying of Windows as as a flagship sort of that's product. Absolutely um, true. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, they've really mm -hmm. been shifting a lot. Of, I mean, Sony so Nadal has been so consistent about the messaging where Microsoft is a data led company. It's all about data analysis and empowering users to be more productive 
And it's been really notable that in most of the keynote speeches he's given at Marquet events, even during the virtual events we've had this year, Windows doesn't really come up as one of the elements that Microsoft sees. I mean, it's a product they have. They're clearly not going to abandon it, but it's not the product that they're staking their future on. So I don't think they're going to do a whole lot of, and then we rolled this out. Yeah, maybe they don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, it was under Satya Nadella that Microsoft's mission statement changed from, uh, well, first it was Windows in every computer, right? Or a computer in every a house. A Windows computer on every desktop. Yeah, running yeah. Microsoft mm -hmm. Windows. Uh, and then under Nadella, it, it was, we want to be, he said many times, we want to be wherever our customers are, but the best experience mm -hmm. will be on Windows. <laughs> and then they dropped that second part. In 2015 at Ignite, they rolled out um, we a mobile-first, cloud-first computing experience. That was the positioning they used. And they reiterated the message, a mobile-first, cloud-first computing experience, which um, I thought was kind of a big deal because what it effectively says is that your choice of device or your uh, choice of operating system matters a lot less than the portability of computing, period. And for the last few years, uh, they've talked about how Microsoft's uh, mission statement now is to empower every user on the planet through technology. So they're really like going big and vague at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so vague. And sounds yeah. like every mission statement ever written for yeah. anything. Yeah, mission statements well, are it's, terrible, aren't they? I'm not being entirely fair to it because I can't recite all of it because I believe it's you're empowering every user. It has something to do with the quality of access at some point, And there's something in there about using data as part of the empowering. But I agree with you. It's a very pie in the sky. Every in theory, like the skies will be clean and the temperatures yeah. will drop and we'll have equality of opportunity <laughs> if we can all just get into Azure. And you're like, eh, really? Clearly <laughs> Sachin Adela is one of the best CEOs ever. He transformed yeah. Microsoft. It revitalized the stock price, revitalized the company, turned it around on a dime. Oh, yeah. But mm -hmm. every time he talks, I glaze over. It is just, <laughs> it's impossible. He's, he's not good at concrete. Have you read Hit Refresh, which is no, the book I should. That you read? Yeah. I, I I urge you to read that because um, if you don't like his speaking style, you might find the book more accessible. And what he does is he lays out a lot of the turnaround story for the company and how that's affect. And you also kind of I feel like you also get a really strong sense of where the company is going to be piloting itself over the next five to yeah. 10 years as well. Well, maybe he so, should get whoever wrote that book yeah. to write his speeches because it's not, it's not <laughs> here. Lisa, I have a, this is, I have a this, question before you. you do that, here's uh -huh. what, okay. here's what a CEO at Microsoft really ought to be like. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, do you think this advanced operating environment is worth? Wait just one minute before you answer. Watch as oh, Windows integrates oh, Lotus One to Three with Miami Vice. Now Good. we can take this Ferrari and paste it right into Windows White. Now, how much do you think Microsoft Windows is worth? Don't answer. Wait until you see Windows White and Windows Paint, and then listen to what else you get at no extra charge: the MS DOS executive, an appointment calendar, a card file, a notepad, a clock, a control panel, a terminal, a Prince Four RAM driver, and can you believe it? Reversi, that's right. All these features in Reversi, all for just, how much did you guess? 500? 1,000? Oh, Even my God. No, it's just $99. That's right. It's $99. It's an incredible value, but it's true. It's Windows from Microsoft. Order today. P.O. Box 286. D.O.S. <laughs> Except in Nebraska. I don't know how they got Palmer to do that. Oh my gosh, delightful. I don't think he was a CEO at the time. Bill was still a CEO. No, he was no, just no. whatever head of sales or whatever it was. But I've always admired that kind of big sales energy. Yeah, I'm sure that was it's an internal. So into my temperament. Yeah, that was a video intended for an internal use only, probably at oh, yeah. a sales meeting where they were laughing and laughing. But uh, it lives yeah. on on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, Oh That's my gosh! Right. The internet Con never forgets. For telling us about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lori. What did you want? To, what did you want to say? I apologize. Lisa, I, just, I was just. I was thinking, like, just from the perspective of a, of a person who follows the Apple ecosystem, 
Mm -hmm. There are, there are times, in fact, up until, you know, three weeks ago (laughs) that, um, a lot of people who were, uh, following Apple were saying that, you know, they're, they're kind of forgetting about the Mac and they're forgetting about their, you know, they've moved on and the Mac is no longer important to them. And then now suddenly, oh, absolutely. That's Mm -hmm. not the case. Do you think Microsoft is, is going to just sort of forget about windows? Do you think that we're going to see a future where there's not really much about windows at all anymore. And they're really just going to be taking care of legacy windows, but it's not, we're not going to see the next windows iteration or something like that. All right. That's a great question. And you can tell it's a great question because I'm saying the stalling thing. That's a great (laughs) question to try to organize my thoughts as I answer it. (laughs) Um, So to begin to answer it, I'm going to backpack, just backpack, backtrack just a little to two beginning premises or or two beginning facts that I'm going to build the rest of my answer on. And the first is that Windows still makes Microsoft um, a serious amount of money every quarter. Like they have three different business divisions. Windows is in one, Azure is in one, and um, productivity, which is where they have Office 365, is in, is in the third. And their Windows and hardware divisions still... Um, it's only been very recently that Azure has overtaken that division in terms of reliably producing revenue every quarter. So Windows still makes them money. That's number one. Um, number two is that when they rolled out Windows 10, they also rolled out the concept of continuous updates and uh, began to promote the idea of Windows as a service, which is kind of a logical predecessor to desktop as a service. So um, I th- Oh, and the third thing I should add, now that I'm thinking about it, is over the course of the last, I want to say, two years or so, we have seen them doing two things with end-user software. One, they're making it really easy to complete software functions across different applications. So if you are in Teams and someone says, hey, can you check out this spreadsheet? You can launch a specific file within Teams and edit it within Teams. You don't have to switch over to Excel, open it, edit it there, and then re-upload it to Teams again. Um, The goal that they're moving towards is they want to break down the siloed functions of apps and just rather have people Mm. think in terms of task flow. And number two, they want people to think of teams as the primary space from which they work. So if you take a look at all three of those things, I think Windows is going to be a product that they keep up as long as they do have a legacy base that can't afford to pull in new computers and push everybody to a cloud first thing. But I think at this point, it's a product they maintain because it makes the money and because they have a user base. And as people move off of it, they're not going to go out of their way to continually reinvent a desktop experience anymore. I think they're going to move you more towards the idea of a collaborative workspace where you can... Um, move things in and out of Teams and or OneDrive or SharePoint. As and you long- can open stuff up like in Windows, and not Windows, excuse me. You can open things up like in, in Word or you can answer emails even from, from Teams. Right. But they're shifting the definition of how they see you working on a computer. As long as computing has been around, this has been like the holy mm-hmm. grail. I can remember Microsoft yeah. talking about this with, you know, the document, you know, with Calm, uh, mm-hmm. Object Desktop. I remember Apple. If, well, Microsoft was going to create, what was that, Longhorn, which was a, a document-based <laughs> yeah. way of thinking of things. Apple has been was doing the same thing with IBM. It, it was called Pink. Yeah. This is, as long as computing has been around, people have said, no, 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 We went on a, completely the wrong way. All users care about is their, is their data and, and manipulating it. That's all that really any computing interaction is. And, and... We we just we focused on the operating system. Who that's infrastructure. Who cares about that? That's like you know saying, uh, you know, I, I want to go to the bathroom, but first I got to install plumbing. It's just not it's not, it's not it's not what users want to do. And that's why I think in the long run, the future clearly for Microsoft and maybe for all computing is cloud based. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I think if you're a small business or a big business, it's very attractive to say, well, just buy thin clients. You don't need to buy these big computers. You no longer have to worry about updates. You no longer have to worry about plumbing. You no longer have to worry about security. You just 
have a productivity tool. And by the way, it's the same whether you're sitting at your desk at home or your desk at work or in your car on your phone. It's the same data. It's, and that's where the cloud is slowly moving us to. And it, I think clearly this is what Satya Nadella is thinking, mm -hmm. is that's the future of Office. That's the future of Windows. And oh, by the way, I get a monthly subscription. So I'm happy. I've got an annuity. The stock market loves that. My stock mm -hmm. price is going to go up. Everybody's going to be happy. I, I think the hazard is that we talk like this as if you don't have like cash strapped municipal governments or school districts or hospitals or um, even highly specialized industries that won't have the money to upgrade to this right. type of computing experience. Yeah. Uh, and I that's think that's the long this is dragging tail that's never going away. I understand. I agree. And one of the things, um, one of the use cases that I, I see and hear about whenever I'm <laughs> back in the before time when I could talk to people at conferences is you'd have somebody who worked in an industry, like say um, they ran a printing shop and I would find out that they had a computer that they still hadn't upgraded from right. Windows 95 because there was a piece of proprietary right. software they had yep. paid somebody to write way back when. Yep. And mm -hmm. they were like, I don't have the money to migrate to, to write another version of the software and migrate it again. So we've jury rigged this entire workflow around obsolete tech and we just try to keep it running. I think that happens a lot more than um uh, well, it's not just tech Windows. companies are willing to it's talk not just about Windows. No, it's not it's look Apple. at Android. I've, look at Android. Well, there are lots of people who are still running Macs that are not even yeah. OS X Macs yeah. because mm -hmm. they're like, I got this piece of software I wrote right. back in 1998. Yeah. It does what I need it to do. I can't upgrade yeah. it. But almost all the security <laughs> yeah. problems happen to that layer of people because yes. they're not getting updated. They're not doing any. I mean, yeah. you know that the Microsoft, mm -hmm. Apple, and Google would love to get rid of the $50 Android phones that haven't been updated since Cupcake. They mm -hmm. would love mm -hmm. to get rid of you know Windows, Windows 95. What? what? Stop! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless a member of Friends is going to come and personally give you a new computer, the odds. Oh, I know. Being able well, to that's different. If Joey upgrade, gives it yeah. to me, I'll take it. No, but, so, that, but that's the thing, though. It's not even. It's not the person. It's not the the computer. It's the yeah. software, and that's yeah. where that. But couldn't is that all run in virtualization? If you were going to run Windows like, ninety five, find a way to fund these people's mm -hmm. business workflows right. or fund these highly industry specific or location specific apps that right. still work. They just don't work because I, the person who wrote them 20 years I ago have, wasn't thinking, oh my gosh, pretty soon everything we do is going to be living on servers that are in rural wherever. <laughs> but Windows Virtual Desktop, they even, my group stuff even says, and you can run Windows 7. I don't know if they mentioned yeah. Windows 95. But, I mean, that's the safe way to run Windows 7. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how they, or XP, or even, I guess, 95. But you'd mm -hmm. have to get that proprietary program up to there. And then yeah. there's the hardware issue because that line printer or that uh, CNC pro, you know, hardware only works with a serial connection over an <laughs> RS-232 port yeah. to a computer running, you know, DOS, then yeah, yeah. you're going to have a problem, I guess. Yeah. 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 So until all of those, you know, small business owners who have those proprietary apps retire, yeah. we're going to be holding on to this stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. So it takes <laughs> yeah. longer than... You think, yeah. but it's, mm -hmm. I mean, there's still people driving, you know, 1963 Thunderbirds, but, yeah. but in general, what you do is you upgrade, you know, your emissions requirements and you slowly face those people out and you, and you slowly move into the future. And I'm sure that's what Microsoft wants to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's this guy who's booting up his PC from a vinyl disc. Oh my God. What? <laughs> Did you, what? My question. Exactly. <laughs> So, um, what? this, what? Yeah. I just know. Yes. No, this yes. This is like no. the most hipster thing I've ever seen this in is my hipster. life. Does this guy have like a waxed mustache? This is from Boggin Jr., the Boggin Jr. blog, B-O-G-I-N-J-R.com. So, first of all, you have to have an IBM PC with a cassette interface. That's the original 1981 what? IBM PC. And what you have to do is when this computer turns on, first it... Here, I, we show you a video of it. First thing that happens is it hits the floppy disk. You'll hear that first. Oh, no floppy. Then it looks for a hard drive. Oh, hmm. No hard drive. Okay. Fire up the cassette interface. And you could say, look, it says needle on the record. So you have to drop the needle on the record no. player. 
He's going to drop the needle on the record player. This Here we go. This is the most steampunk thing I've seen in a while. <laughs> he's, he's got the audio connected to the cassette oh, port wow. interface. Now, hold your ears because this is ugly when you're going to hear it, but you're going to hear what And anybody who's as old as me remembers using cassette mm. to boot up computers or to save programs, and mm. you're, you're going to hear the noise that we used to hear when that happened. Here it goes. We're dropping the needle. Okay. Lowest needle drop ever. Yeah. Well, you gotta be careful. You don't. You don't want to scratch it. Mm. And now yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a modem a little bit, right? Yeah. That's data. Yeah. That's the master boot record. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> how did, how, I just. How did he press that record? I'm just, oh, he must have I'm, a record yeah, press. He's got like blown. a record lathe. He must lathe. have a lathe. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. This is incredible. And then hard drive now detected because he he and now he, the computer is booting. I hope somebody somewhere is writing like the techno thriller where it turns out that somebody has smuggled a whole lot of data out of the country described, uh, excuse yes. me, disguised like nothing but, um, you know, hipster records. Yeah. Where they're like, oh, the guy has a really boring Arctic monkeys collection. Let's let him go. And it turns out instead it's like, no, no, these are industry secrets. <laughs> there is a guy who's... Go ahead. There's always something to be gotten out of experiments, right? Like you're, you're sitting there yeah. thinking, why would you do this to show that you can, but then maybe there's something you can get out of it. I don't know if I can find this, but there is a guy who's written an operating system for the end times he sees coming in the next 30 years when oh. China splits with us, they no longer make our chips or we can't figure out how to make them, whatever. Mm -hmm. And all we can do is scavenge parts from speaking spells <laughs> and, you know just chips that are lying around and he's written an operating system for these mm -hmm. simple chips so that we can uh at some point get back to computing <laughs> the, te the teddy ruxpin operating system yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> i can't I, I i wish i could find it it's something like, i can't remember oh, the name wow. of it it's like the end times operating system or something like that it's hysterical so but he says look you're going to be glad that I spend mm -hmm. the time writing this because someday, because <laughs> someday you're going to need, gonna it. need it, <laughs> or maybe you're going to need a uh, vinyl record that can uh, boot up your uh, old IBM. <laughs> I feel like we're thinking PC. small. You should actually be looking at trying to figure, trying to make operating systems that reproduce themselves based on fungi or or there you go, something yeah. that you can DNA, grow. DNA, <laughs> DNA chips, yeah. yeah, something you can yeah. grow, and then you just yeah. save the seeds, and you, you know you can grow mm -hmm. another computer, maybe. Yeah. That's Call what the, the aliens did 5,000 years ago. <laughs> Maybe that's what we are right now. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh -huh. That sounds like you, you just finished watching Raised by Wolves. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. Can you believe Was that wild? But, you know, wasn't yes. that frustrating at the end? Like, yes. we made no progress. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I'm watching well, that was, the I show, the, and that, I, have I haven't seen the end. Okay, no spoilers. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. No spoilers. Let's just say that... It's a, it's a journey. It's a journey mm -hmm. is right. With a destination that you may not understand. Yeah, mm. but that's okay. But isn't she cool <laughs> when she takes out her eyes and flies and goes, and, and people explode? That, that's cool. Yeah. This doesn't yeah. make me want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, what's, what's interesting is the first few episodes were created by, what's his name? The Aliens guy. And Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott. And they have a real Ridley Scott sensibility to them. You mm -hmm. can see, and then it feels like Ridley left. <laughs> mm. Well, I think there were different directors for almost every episode. Yeah, he did the first mm. couple. And you can feel it. <laughs> yes. It feels like, oh, I'm done with this. And then somebody else said, well, let's see where we can go. It's like three people wrote this, the novel. Mm. Um, and at first it started to be an Aliens prequel, didn't it? Don't you think that was kind of what was going on? And then it got weird. Yeah, I can I can kind of see what you mean by that. Yeah. How far are you? It, it did feel that uh, way. And then it, yeah. It took a left turn. Mm. <laughs> it uh, took like uh, four left turns. I'm pretty... <laughs> you know what happens when you take more than three left turns? You end up in the where you started. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're like third episode, fourth episode? And I think I'm the fourth episode, and yeah. I'm, I'm early enough in that um, it's about not to, a lot of big things have happened No, no, yet. it's about to, uh, yeah, it gets slow yeah. for a little bit, and then, what? What? <laughs> what? Well, and then, and then I, I feel, feel like that way anyway. Hit, <laughs> yeah. 
you hit what, what, what? And then, wait, what? Wait, what? <laughs> and then, huh? Raised by Wolves, and which then, huh. is only on HBO Max, I think, right? That's an yeah. HBO Max yeah. exclusive. Um, but it's, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> It's like, I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, well, what you said this, uh, what you said that kicked that off is is the sort of like, is it, was this all left by the aliens? That yeah, started everything? that's obvious. I feel like it has that vibe. It's obvious. Yeah. Uh, no spoilers. It psychedelics are left, uh, alien technologies are left behind mm -hmm. to mess with us. <laughs> right? As Everybody knows that. <laughs> oh, no, maybe not. Maybe I took too many psychedelics, and that's just what happens. I, I was here for a technology podcast. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Back, <laughs> back we go. A couple of things, real quick, before we wrap it up, because it is getting late. But I, but yeah. I, I just so was, there was a lot actually. Given that we're yeah. in the end times, there was a lot to talk about. Google is becoming a bank. Mm. Google mm. Pay uh, is going to now, ha which is funny because Google did this once before with a credit card. Remember. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to start, by next year, they will have uh, banks all over the world. They'll have, uh, they have a bunch of partners, the f launch partners, City and Stanford Federal Credit Union. Uh, mm -hmm. You're going to be able to get a credit card. You're going to be able to do payments. This has been the holy grail. I thought, I always thought this was what Apple and Facebook were going to do. And they seem to have lost their nerve. But uh, in some parts of of the developing world, like in Africa, M Pesa is the dominant financial uh, instrument because they don't have computers, they don't really have banks, but they seem to have smartphones, and so they use that for everything. In China, uh, uh, WeChat is the complete like is everything, and I feel like Google would love to be the everything company, right? But I think that they always try to pave. The, Google's interesting. I can remember Google Loon, like making sure that in, in order for Google to succeed, everybody has to have an internet connection, and also mm -hmm. for Google to succeed, everybody needs to be able to make payments. Right. So it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like yep. let's make it easy for people to get access to things they might not have access for. And and given how Google often behaves, it would make sense for them to go off, uh, go for sort of the um, small transactions, people early in their economic life. Right. I, I bet that's what they're going to do. And though, if you're threatened by it, you shouldn't be because Google loses interest so quickly <laughs> that next <laughs> next year it'll be something else they'll be doing. Well, I think well, that they would argue that they give it away from things too. that don't work. Yeah, banks don't work, so we're going to do it better. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh -huh. um, but isn't that same, uh, aren't they kind of improving or replacing their sort of I, I don't, I'm not sure what the name of Google uses for it, but it's Apple's version of the wallet app where yeah. they're going to have all kinds of, um, you know, budget tracking stuff. But then they're also going to be collecting your data so that they can right. tell you what you should buy with the money that they're put, setting up for you through their partner banks. We like, call that personal there's, there's finance. interesting things going on We call there. that personal yeah. finance insights, yeah. <laughs> deals and banking services. Yeah, this is coming mm -hmm. next year. Uh, another thing Google's doing is Stadia. In fact, this is not just Google at this point. Microsoft with their streaming gaming service xCloud, NVIDIA with their streaming gaming service GeForce, all have solved the Apple Store problem the same way with a web app, a progressive web you know app running in Safari. You can play Fortnite. You'll be able to play Cyberpunk 277 when it comes out uh, December 10th. Hmm. Uh, GeForce now works on Chromebooks, but it's going to be coming soon. And I think this is the proof of concept for streaming Windows. Because if you can stream AAA game titles... Mm. You can right. definitely stream Windows. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think um, this. what's really interesting about this is when, um, you know, when... When uh, there, the, the hearings, the antitrust hearings and things like that were coming up and they were saying, well, what, you know developers have to use your app platform if they want to have apps and how is that fair and and apple over and over and over again said make a web app right they just like you know shrug their shoulders and like that's not a problem make a web app and finally you know that through <laughs> they took them up on this, it the, yeah and i like i would rather be able to have that direct user experience with the app and really kind of get the most out of it and hopefully someday there's a, a compromise will come so that apple can get what they want and you know, Google Stadia can get what they want. But for now, 
a web app. Thank you. Thank you for doing that so that I can play these games from my devices. I'm excited and, and about it. And this is the argument for these antitrust, at least <sighs> hearings, if not actual lawsuits, because it's, it, it, it sends a signal to Apple. Because Apple could say, no, no, you're not going to do a web app either. They could pull the plug on WebSM or the services that PWAs require. But they can't now because the mm -hmm. government's looking at them. Yeah. And they're, okay, yeah, make a web app. I guess we better stand by that. <laughs> uh, we'll see if WebSM and, and these tools are fast enough. I, my suspicion is they are. And actually, Apple may secretly hope that it works well because on their M1 chip, people have said, well, you're not going to get gaming. You don't have GPUs. There's no discrete GPUs. Well, you don't need them because the G GPUs are in the cloud running on mm -hmm. Google or Microsoft's uh, or NVIDIA's servers. And all you need is a is a M1 enabled browser. Oh look, Chrome is available for M1. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's really interesting. And then they also didn't Apple just announce that they're lowering the, their take from apps. That, Fifteen percent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But so maybe they are sort of setting the groundwork for that. Just yeah, it's fifteen percent if you make less than a million dollars. Right. Which means, that's what, 70, 80% of the store? Yeah, the it's a store? lot of small people, but it's not Google, Microsoft. <laughs> it's not It's no. not Fortnite. Uh, <laughs> Definitely yeah. not Fortnite, yeah. yeah. We heard that <laughs> cry. <laughs> so, but, I, but I guess you're right in this, in the sense, uh, Lindsay, that uh, that's Apple also responding to scrutiny Absolutely. from government. Okay, okay. And from for anybody who's like it, making less than a million dollars, that's great news. That's, that's cutting in half Apple's take. So that's really good news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to we got to take a little break. We're running out of time. I don't, I don't want to keep you people too too long. You've got mm -hmm. shows to watch. <laughs> Whatever else it is people islands do. Islands to maintain. A, islands to maintain. <laughs> Actually, that's the real truth is, you know, I had the KK <laughs> Slider conference concert. Now I really want to start terraforming <laughs> on my Animal Crossing's island. This is a bad problem. I am out of control. Uh, our show uh, this week, all of our shows had so much fun. Uh, I, we, we, we thought it would be fun if we made a little short video for you to watch. Here's what happened this week on Twit. Well, you yes. know, this is, I think, year 18 of the holiday tradition of ugly Christmas sweaters. Oh, man, is it? Are you wearing one right now? I am. At the bottom of this sweater... There is a place for an actual fire. What? Oh, that's so clever. Previously on Twit, iOS Today. We're going to talk about our new iPhone. I guess it's big. I don't have particularly big hands. I love it. And it is, it feels heavy, but that feels it like heavy. quality, right? Security Now. Where do most malicious Android apps come from? I'm going to guess the Play Store. Oh, Leo, yes. The bulk of Android apps are not coming from unauthorized third-party app sources and repositories, you know, as someone might think. Mac Break Weekly. Renee has all three of the new Macintosh computers. We will, of course, be talking about the M1 chip. Oh, I benchmarked this. I did the Stonks version of benchmarking, Leo, because I knew that's only the only thing anyone would be asking. So I did the Geek Benches, the Cine Benches, the GFX, bench, anything that with the word bench in it. I think I did a park bench. This week in Google. They're called fleets. What is the singular? Is there a fleet or are they just all fleets? Would you do a fleets? Is the verb form to flit? I will flit. The I will fleet. flit the fleet. The fleet. I flit. I fleeted. I fleeted. It doesn't I, sound good at all. And then in the past tense, when it's gone, I flat. Twit. Bring your brain. We'll do the rest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to the great Jim Cutler, who is our uh, our pro bono VO guy. We appreciate it, uh, Jim. Uh, our show today brought to you by IT Pro TV. These guys I've known since practically they started. Uh, Don Pizzette and uh, Tim Broom were IT trainers in the traditional classroom setting. And they came to an NAB conference, National Association of Broadcasters Conference. I was on a panel with a bunch of people who were streaming like we do at Twit. And they said a little light bulb went off. They said, what if we did IT training like Twit does podcasts? We And 
IT Pro TV was born, they have really grown a lot faster than we have. They now have five full-time studios in their Gainesville, Florida headquarters. Superb IT content for people who either want to get into IT, and so they need to take these exams to get the certifications to get those first jobs, or people who are already in IT who want to polish their skills, get a better job, make more money. It is literally the best online IT education uh, platform in the world. And you can learn about any kind of IT, whether it's being a developer or help, help desk support or a network administrator or a business professional, sysadmin, and of course security. And what's more, IT Pro TV makes it fun. These are real IT professionals teaching you. They love it. They're passionate about it, but they're also engaging. So you really, it's the kind of thing where it's easy to learn. You can watch it on your computer, on your Roku, on your Apple TV, on any device you have. Put it on the big screen, listen to it in the car, watch it on your computer. And I know people leave it on all day and they're just constantly learning. And man, do they have the training, 5,800 hours of up-to-date IT training. That's why they're constantly working in their studios. They keep it up to date. This stuff changes fast, but they change even faster. 375 combined certifications. You're getting the best IT education around. They're the official video training partner for CompTIA. So if you're looking for those really fundamental certs that every IT professional needs to get started, A+, plus, Security+, plus, Network+, plus, they've got more than 12 CompTIA. TIA courses, Microsoft IT training, Cisco training, Linux, Apple, security, cloud, whatever it is. Look at all this. They do, this month is Cert Nexus month. All November at IT Pro TV, you can learn about getting certified as a CyberSec first responder, a cyber secure coder, or a certified Internet of Things practitioner. This is one thing I love about this IT field and IT Pro TV. Whatever your interest, there's a place, there's a niche for you. And man, talk about job security. These are, these are positions that are never going away. Every company in the world needs strong IT support. You're there for them. What a great career awaits you. Check out their podcast, Technado. Don Puzzit does that. Uh, featuring industry guests, IT news recaps, uh, everything you'd like to know. Just kind of it's that's free and it's available to anybody just to kind of keep up on the field. But the training is there, and that's what you really need. Go to itpro.tv slash twit and get that professional IT education the right way, the affordable way. If I'm going to make it more affordable, if you use the offer code twit30, you could take 30% off any consumer subscription for as long as you stay active. Years if you want. That makes it a really good deal. The most affordable way, the best way to learn. IT training you'll actually want to watch. What about that, huh? itpro.tv slash twit. Don't forget the offer code TWIT30 for that big 30% discount. IT Pro TV. Build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey with some of my favorite people. ITPro.tv slash TWIT. Sad news if you're a fan of um, astronomy, if you're a fan of SETI, the big Arecibo uh, Observatory... In Puerto Rico, this was, I don't know, was it was one of the largest dishes out there. Two of the cables broke. It is 57 years old, uh, and it, it is not salvageable. They're going to demolish it. Wow. The National Science Foundation said, boy, we would love to save it, but we're much more concerned about the lives of, of people. To, you know, people visit the observatory, but there are also many astronomers work there. The towers are 300 feet tall. If the... Uh, remaining cables break the whole thing it's a 900 ton suspended platform could crash down onto the dish the towers could fall over they don't know in which direction um so they're just they're gonna they're gonna take it down sean jones at the nsf said the decision is not an easy one to make but the safety of people is our number one priority so i thought i'd uh, pass that along um you could see the damage that was caused just by the failure of the the first cable Wow. Um, yeah. wow. Yeah. That is pretty rough. You might have seen that it. That looks in... very first seen in a post apocalyptic sci fi. Yeah, oh, right? Yeah, definitely. Before yeah. you take yeah. it down, make a couple of movies. Contact was made there. <laughs> uh, Golden Eye, the James Bond movie. Um, the, I think it started with uh, Hurricane Maria, which caused mm -hmm. a lot of damage. And then in, uh, in August, another cable went. And so, <sighs> sigh. 
Um, let's see. Anything else we want to uh, mention? Marissa Meyer has found a new company. She kind of wish she was, you know, big shot at Google. Mm -hmm. Went to save Yahoo. Didn't work out so good. Sold off Yahoo. Now she's running Sunshine Labs, which is a contact management app for iOS. She, I think she really is a product person. Mm -hmm. She just really wants to do something cool with software. Yeah. And I, I got it. The right gig I, for her because it was a content job. Yeah, mm -hmm. I got it. It's um, reminds me a little bit of Plaxo, which is not a good <laughs> good mm. thing to remind anybody <laughs> of. But what you do is you import your contacts into it. I don't like it that there's a big ad for the product mm -hmm. here. They should just start there. Um, it does a few things. It, you see, some of my contacts are enhanced by sunshine. Mm. Uh, I don't know what that means. And then um, people can, who are other Sunshine users. So my friend Rafe Needleman, mm -hmm. he, he sent me a thing saying he was using Sunshine, saw me, said, could you update it? So I sent him my information uh, and then he sent me his. So he exchanged his info with me. So that's a little Plaxo-like, kind of that behind-the-scenes sharing. It's kind of cool if I run into somebody, which I won't, but if I ever do, <laughs> I can exchange <laughs> info with them. So it lets me choose the info card. It's okay, you can show this. The info <laughs> card I want to use, I have my personal and professional. Mm -hmm. and then I can, But I can even, even select one thing at a time. So here's my birthday. I can send it to everybody. That's cool. Um, I can make an intro if inside it. So I could say, huh? Lindsay, uh, meet Lisa. Lisa, meet Lindsay and send that off. So that's kind of Sounds like a cool. little streamlined LinkedIn and yeah. you're, helping it, you're helping it create all sorts of data and social maps. Well, that's the other thing that comes to mind because yeah. <laughs> they're, they're getting all your contacts. Uh, well, they're also seeing who your relationships are. They can probably log who you're interacting with and how frequently and they will probably be able to rank you based on how much data you input into the system and how many people you manage to bring in. <laughs> Yeah. She yeah. Uh, she's uh, working with a longtime uh, colleague, both at Google mm -hmm. and uh, at Yahoo, Enrique Enrique Munoz Torres, mm -hmm. uh, to create Sunshine. So I mean, you know, good for her. You're right. She's a that's a good way to say it. She's a product person. People like mm -hmm. her and my friend Kevin Rose. That's what they love. They they just want to do new and interesting products. So yeah. so good for them, right? Side well, note, Rafe Needleman used to be my boss. No yeah. kidding. Mm -hmm. He used to be yeah. my ex-wife's roommate. Back in so. the days, <laughs> right? Yeah. Actually, Rafe's been on Twitter many times. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just funny that he should pop up there. What's he doing? He, he got into some other business than news, I thought. I should check. It says he I can view yeah, it. He wants you to update. At, yeah. <laughs> oh, he's Evernote. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. He went to Evernote. I forgot about yeah. that. No, oh, I love Rafe. Yes. Yeah. He was your boss at CNET? Or he was where my was boss that? at CNET. That's hysterical. Mm -hmm. Small world. It is a small world. Do you want me to introduce him? <laughs> On Sunshine? <laughs> I, I, could ex you could I need to install it first, but I can sure. introduce you. Well, right now it's invitation only. I was very pleased this morning. I got the text message saying, oh. you're in. Well, then you have to invite me. I will invite you. There you go. I will invite you. Um, why did I get this link? Oh, this is kind of depressing. So, um, I don't know. Have you ever watched a drywall guy work? <laughs> yes, it's amazing and hard. It's amazing. <laughs> They're so fast. They cut it, they, they mud it, they, or they cut it, they tape it, they mud it, they paint it, and they work so fast, and now there's a robot. Oh. No. That apparently can do the same thing. It's canvas. Mm -hmm. is going to... Believe it, though. You don't think they could do it? I think that they could do it in like new construction where everything is absolutely yeah. plumb and square. Yeah. In fact, that's the plan is to do it only on the big 10,000 square foot facilities. But um, in my like 19 like teens built house, there's no yeah. way that robot could do it. I'm going to say, Lindsay, you, you talk like somebody who has real estate in the Bay Area because I've got a house yeah. built in 1904 and it's the yeah. same thing. We're all oh, but you know, you got a horsehair lath and plaster on that house, right? Some oh, of it, yeah. yes. Um, some of the walls have been rearranged over the course mm -hmm. of the last uh, hundred and some years. Uh, so <laughs> I believe our bathroom has drywall. I want to <laughs> see a classic John Henry versus the locomotive. 
I want to see a guy, a drywall guy who's really a pro against this robot. I have to say this robot looks like it would lose. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't seem like it's that efficient. It, look how big it is, for one thing. It's, that takes up, like, the space look of a couple of humans. Look how slow it is, too. These guys and are... it seems like it goes kind of slow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I'm wondering if people would buy this because it can be a business expense and therefore tax deductible compared probably. to having to hire a crew. Yeah. I mean, right. just... Yeah. They have literally canvassed the company. Like, who wants this, I guess, is the question. Yeah. Well, I think the idea is a big industrial park where you have a lot of yeah. just flat, square rooms, yeah. tilt-ups, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, yeah, the company that does it... Or more of those. Can, mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Canvas.build has been... They've been in stealth for three years designing this thing. An artificial intelligence drywall mutter. Just what the world needs. Um, I think on that dystopian note, we could probably <laughs> wrap. I should have saved the booting That's vinyl record for this. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lindsay Turn Time. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, we don't get you on, all three of you, we don't get you on nearly enough. I'm really glad you could be here. Senior Vice President for Content and Audience at CNET. I wanted to show everybody uh, the project you've been working on at CNET uh, for the Holiday Gift Guide. This is going to be a little bit of a different year for buying stuff, isn't it? It is. And, you know, it's been interesting. People have been starting earlier. I think because we're all stuck at home and we're yeah. worried about money. And so people are just kind of yeah. looking for every single deal yeah. they can find. I'm a Christmas so we're, Eve we're guy. Help you out with that. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, you know, the husband and father that goes out on Christmas Eve and all I can find is one target that's Aww. open late <laughs> and, you know, and everything's wiped off the shelves. So everybody gets the electric swizzle stick or something. It's like the worst. <laughs> it's the worst. I'm a terrible, and I'm already planning. I've already figured out. I've yes. like got lists. Like I never did this in life. What? Wow! Oh, congratulations. I know but, what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah, check it out. I'll help you with that. Yeah. So you've got uh, categories under thirty, fifty, a hundred, and two hundred fifty dollars. You've this. Is it all tech? Oh, wait a minute. Toy lovers. Wait. It's a not. Minute. It's not all tech. Wait We've a expanded. Minute. The baby Yoda plush. Oh. <laughs> There's some good stuff I in there, it. and we have people who are, are, like are keeping it really up to date, which is what I'm really proud of. Is like that people working to you make sure that if we're posting things like, oh, we found a good deal, we don't leave it up. They need to rename it. this, though, because it wasn't this the thing they used on the uh, Crew Dragon as their zero gravity indicator. So when the <laughs> when the, it was right. Right, John. Yes. yes yeah. Right. When they got into when they got into space and they were in zero gravity, the little baby Yoda floated around and they said, oh, it's safe, safe to take off our seatbelts. <laughs> so that's really they got to rename that sucker. The baby yes. Yoda zero also, gravity. I find indicator. baby Yoda just conceptually manipulative. It's so cute mm -hmm. that it feels manipulative. Yeah. I'm just, that's yeah. a side note. Yeah. And it isn't really baby Yoda. <laughs> right. It feels like the Ewoks. Like you had the Ewoks in. Yeah. Um, and what about those Yoda. porgs? Right? Uh, same. Somebody we know has a porg. Just over her left shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> oh, does, it, does it have like the little suckers so you can stick it on a window? That's or not is manipulative it at all. Look at the size of those eyes. Oh my gosh, it peeps. <laughs> now how much would you pay? Yeah. It peeps. You know what? I also oh. I also have this too, so oh, I'm a sucker uh, for that. Oh, it's really small. I didn't think it was yeah, that I've small. Got, I got. Oh no, these are different. The, the one the one I'm holding is is different than oh, the one okay. that's on the. That looks like a that's troll a plush doll. Piece, so. If you had hair it on it, it'd cute. be a troll doll. It's so cute. <laughs> it's so cute. It's like engineered for cuteness with the way that ears are exactly the yeah. big eyes. Yeah. So this Lindsay, like what's gonna is good at. what's gonna be the toy of the year? Is it gonna be Squeaky the balloon dog? I actually uh, <laughs> uh, that is it's a, it, that's really cool, but I, I hate yeah. to say it, it's gonna be game consoles. Yeah, <laughs> if you it can is get one, consoles, if you can yeah. get them. Oh my God! I was you know I mean I was up at midnight and then Walmart said they had some on. Thursday and I got in at 12 noon and they were gone already and mm -hmm. uh, it's frustrating. <laughs> I'm trying to get a PS5 for uh, Michael for his 18th, but I don't think it's going to happen. I told you, Michael, uh. maybe for your 19th. Oh, <laughs> along with Aww. everything else, poor Michael. Wah, wah. I know. Well, maybe I could find something. You've got here, you've got a category called teenage boys. 
<laughs> Dickie Eisenhower's an work jacket. No, I'm not going to mm-hmm. give that to a... They, okay, but you're really? it's a good cool recommendation. Looking. He would I'm like it? You. See, yeah. maybe. Yeah, see, really CNET cool. knows something I don't know. Yeah. It's really cool. <gasps> Why do they... Dickie's is, it, is now a streetwear brand. Is this yeah. what Eisenhower wore? Why do they call it an Eisenhower? It does look a little bit like a military field jacket, like you could imagine him wearing it. A Kodak projector? Oh, but it's not for slides. It's for TV. It's for TV, so when your kid goes and socially distances (gasps) in somebody's backyard with their pod. Oh, he would love this. Mm -hmm. It's actually, they do that. Okay, you're winning here. Winning, or how about the Bagu 16-inch Puffy oh, laptop wow. sleeve. Oh, I want that. That is cool. It's like the sleeping bag you always wanted, but it's just for your laptop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would just be jealous of my laptop. I know. Like, yeah. There's Looks so, like, in like, so there. Do they have maybe like yeah. a snuggie for people that could do the same thing where you're just there with your little hand sticking out typing? <laughs> well, if you put Velcro on the laptop that. bagu, you could, you know, Velcro mm-hmm. it to your bagu. Yeah. I do need something for that M1 laptop. It deserves a special thing. Mm-hmm. All right. That's uh, CNET.com. Is there slash a... Slash holiday. Just slash holiday. That's mm-hmm. easy. The holiday gift guide. We're going to... Yeah, we're shopping already. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Is, is this... It's not just Black Friday. It's Black November now. It is. Yeah. I mean, I'm... So all of the major stores are posting their Black Friday deals early and they're calling them Black Friday deals probably because that's the most popular search term. Yeah. But I bought something for my mom today based on the Black Friday deal. Mm-hmm. Oh, I want this. What is this? This this is uh, some weird... <laughs> I, w- I want whatever that is. It looks like an office desk, but it's like, I don't know, but it's not. It's a- like an ergonomically, it's like the kind, it's like one of those kneeling chairs, but yeah, with a desk. With a desk in. attached. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. That'll be good for my joints. Good Ooh, for your core. I love this microphone, the Shure MV5. This is good. Nice job. CNET.com slash holiday. Your holiday Appreciate it. gift guide. Oh, I bought a bunch of these. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love these. Yeah. Uh, what's go? There it is. Save your back with the edge desk system. Mm-hmm. It looks like it might take over uh, the you know, mm-hmm. like it's got a robot and it might just kind of. <laughs> you also I, need a lot of room for that, but yeah. Again, yeah. speaking from a Bay Area real estate, but you could <laughs> fold it up. So this is what you need for the kid, the poor kid who doesn't have a desk, is zooming, and uh, yeah. and is mm-hmm. sitting at the kitchen table, and you need she needs a desk. We'll get her this the edge desk. Oh, that's pretty. Yeah. See, we've just sold a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Lisa Schmeiser, Windows IT Pro. I'm sorry, IT Pro today. I always put the Windows in there. For no, well, we used to be, we used to cover Windows pretty exclusively right. and then rebranded. So the confusion's understandable. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> it's IT Pro today. What you got going on, Lisa? Anything you want to share with the world? Um, I wish I did, but our end of the year package uh, isn't coming out until December. So. Oh, you'll just come back in December then. Uh, How about if that? You'll have me, sure. Uh, of yeah. course we will. I know what Lori's working on. She just put out her iPhone 12 mini review. I love this picture because it makes it makes you look huge and the makes iPhone it. looks so little. It just, it but just, it is so little. It's so little. Let me see it. Show us. Aww. Do you have it there? Oh, it's look pretty. You got the blue oh. one. Yeah, oh, I did. I nice. love the blue. It's it's a great color. So, yeah. But now, is battery life okay? It's fine. You know, it, it is lower than what I'm used to with the Pro models. I get down to about 20, 25, 15 to 25% at the end of a day. So, it, it it's it's oh, noticeable. But you still got but some left. A little. Yeah, and, and here's the thing, though. It's so small that the idea of bringing a battery pack with me or getting a right. case that's a, got you a battery, yeah. I don't have a problem with that because the phone is oh. so small right. that I'm okay with doubling up. Right. So, And if I was going to go somewhere where I thought I was going to use a lot of battery, I would be bringing that anyway. Now I have a lighter, smaller phone and the battery pack. And I was going to bring the battery pack with the Pro model. Now I'm bringing a battery pack and my phone is tiny. So it works out. It's very <laughs> cute imore.com for that review and of course you'll be back tuesday for a mac break weekly i will not be here i'm going to take a couple of days off what? Uh, yeah i know i'm taking the week off to 
make turkey or something. Ah, yeah, for a three-person Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. I, I before I realized we weren't going to be able to over, I ordered an eight-pound ham and a seventeen-pound turkey. Oh. <laughs> We're going to be Leo, well fed. <laughs> please tell me that you're going to use your Traeger. I am going to Traeger the turkey. Mm, yes. That is our pellet uh, grill that you talked me into. <laughs> and I'm Sorry. so grateful. No. <laughs> I'm so grateful. And I'm trying to figure out if I can I can like cook it for nine hours. Like if I could put it in <laughs> at three in the morning or something. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I'll have to figure that out. But yeah, yeah, I got a nice fresh turkey from Diesel Farms and I cannot wait. I'm very excited. And then we also got... That Oteri pe pizza oven. Mm -hmm. Did, were we talking oh. about that on Mac Break Weekly? I think we were. I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, this thing uses pellets to um, make to have a stone wood fired oven. Yeah. And so they can have it's yeah. Woo. Wood fire pizza. Woo. I want to come over to your backyard so yes, bad. Yes, we got such we got so many cooking implements outdoors now. Mostly because my wife won't let me keep them inside, but that's okay. <laughs> but this, if there's ever a need for it, it's right now, right? Because yes. the, like our best way, our, our safest way to I'm interact with anywhere. other people yeah. is in the backyard. So. Yeah. So I think that's that's, what, that's a, a good justification. <laughs> we were going to have Thanksgiving in the backyard, then we realized, well, it's going to be freezing and it could even be raining. So we're going to make all that stuff and just drive around. We're going to make a caravan Aww. Thanksgiving and say, throw it as we go by. Here's your turkey. <laughs> Hold on. Here's the stuffing. Thank you, Lori. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Lisa. You too. Have a great Thanksgiving. You too. I hope you have a wonderful time. Uh, are you doing a big one or a little one? Or Oh, me? Yeah. Um, my folks live with us, so there's the five of us. Oh, so you got a pretty big pod. It's... <laughs> You know, last year we hosted 35 people, oh. so, so this feels really small by comparison. I bet you're yeah. looking forward to it, right? I, I am, because yeah. it's just going to be, just, you know, one we day want. we yeah. nailed down our menu, the yeah. turkey's already thawing out. We're really happy yeah. about that. That's nice. Mm -hmm. And Lindsay, yeah. you've got a large pod, too. Well, the pod, for lots of different family reasons, is splitting up and going to their other pods oh, for nuts. Thanksgiving. So, no, actually... My boyfriend and I are going to make duck cassoulet and take it to the beach. Oh, oh my that God. That's amazing. Can I oh. be in your pod? Yeah. I really am looking forward to oh my, my pod God. On Thanksgiving. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Oh, yes. I bought a two pound bag of flagiole beans. Mm. I just bought that same yes. thing. Suitable for making cassoulet. All I need is a duck, some sausages. Oh, I love cassoulet. <gasps> yeah. Oh, you're going to have a that's nice That's going to be happening. Oh, I'm I so jealous. I hope it's jealous. good. Oh, it will be great. Are you making it or is he? We're doing it together. We both like to mm. cook. That's so it's going to be so fun. romantic. Mm. Wow. Cassoulet on the beach. Nice. Thank you all for being here. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed our uh, L word version of Twit. <laughs> Lisa, Leo, Lindsay, and Lori. Yep. That wasn't so it? fun. Yeah, really yeah, fun. Really it was. Nice to see it was so great to see everybody. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank we do you. Twit at 2.30 p.m. Pacific on a Sunday afternoon, 5.30 Eastern Time, 21.30, no, 22.30 UTC. If you want to tune in, you can watch. There's live audio and video streams at twit.tv slash live. It's kind of the unedited uh, come-as-you-are version. If you're watching that, though, you should be in the chat room at irc.twit.tv. They're all watching live, too. Uh, after the fact, on-demand versions of everything we do available at our website, twit.tv. It's a podcast, so you can download it and listen at your leisure. We encourage you to do that. Uh, if you are uh, listening to a podcast, though, you want to get interactive, you can go to our forums, which are always available at www.twit.community, a great place to talk. We also have a YouTube channel for every show we do, including This Week in Tech. And the best thing to do probably is to, uh, is to go to your favorite podcast application and subscribe. That way you'll get it automatically the minute it's available. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'll be back uh, next, uh, next week for Twit. I'm just going to take a couple of days off in the midweek. Um, but do have a great Thanksgiving if you're in a country that celebrates Thanksgiving. I think Australians are doing it today. And the Canadians, of course, they celebrate it in October. They're way ahead of us. Um, but I'll see you next time. Another twit is, is in the can. Bye-bye.